All right, welcome to our July 6, 2020 Club Cubase Google Hangout. We will get started in a few minutes. Uh, we're going to let people get logged in for those watching live. If you're watching the replay of this, you may want to skip ahead till about 10 minutes uh, after we get everyone logged in and we start getting some topics uh, generated. I'm just going to do a quick, okay, it seems like audio is coming through fine. Um, my name is Greg Undo. I'm presenting from outside of Washington, D.C. in Alexandria, Virginia. For today's Hangout, I'll be the one that will be fielding questions. Um, I work for Yamaha Corporation of America as a Steinberg product specialist. Uh, if you haven't been on a Hangout before, basically it's a live interactive Q&A session. We can ask, you can ask questions in the chat field. Uh, we'll try to get through as many questions as possible uh, and try to answer each question as completely and succinctly as possible. We'll go for several hours so sh and we'll try to have the topics uh, indexed later tonight so that you could just jump to see the question and jump to a particular timestamp and see the topic. Um, we will uh, get started again in about 10 minutes after the hour. Uh, like many of you, uh, my family is working at home, so you may hear my wife above me on conference calls or walking. Uh, her office is directly above mine, and my son is home. Um, we, so I may have to take a break and get a Disney movie started for him in a little bit, so I'll apologize in advance for that. If you want to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from, uh, that's always a wonderful thing. We'll see. We usually have about five continents represented. So we'll see if we get someone from Australia. Uh, I know it's incredibly late or early there, uh, but we'll see. So tell us uh, where you're from. And if you have questions, please feel free to leave it into the chat field. If you do have a question, uh, we'll try to avoid um, asking the same question repeatedly because uh, as we go through the chats, if we have the same question coming up 20 times in a hangout or multiple times, uh, you know, it could slow everything down. So we will, if we could try to avoid doing that, it would be appreciated. Uh, if you want to submit questions in advance, you can submit them to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Once again, clubcubase at steinberg.de. So let's go ahead and see who's on our hangout. So we have Ace from Texas. All right, so we have uh, Jason from South Shields, England. Okay, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Matt, good to see you on a hangout again. Okay, so we have Greencastle, Pennsylvania. Helsinki, Finland. Okay, so we have London, Slovenia. And you see my timeline, my chat timeline may jump periodically. Uh, so we have Wales from Madrid. I've been there several times. New York City, been there. Used to go all the time, New York. We have India. Okay. Okay, so I see a Groove Agent 5 question. All right, so we have Michael from Weatherford, Texas. Good to see you on a Hangout. Okay, so it's 1 a.m. in Australia, and we have Australia present. That's good. All right, so we have Europe, North America, Australia. We have Asia. All right, we need South America, and then we'll at least have five. I'm still hoping to get someone from Antarctica live, but that's been elusive so far. All right, so Alabama. Okay, I used to live in Alabama when I was a young boy in Huntsville. All right, Southern Maryland, not too far from me. I'm kind of probably just across the river and down a little bit. Okay, so we have Arcadia, California. Sir Robert from Atlanta, Long Beach, California. 
A lot of my colleagues at Yamaha live in Long Beach. All right, so we have Seattle. Okay, so just seeing some questions. All right, so we have India. All right, so we have Ambi and Dave. Good to see him on Hangout. All right, Colombia. All right, so we have South America. All right, so we have Kingstown, New York. All right, so we have Germany. All right, so Brian lives near Huntsville. That's good. I, my dad was in the space program in his early 70s there. Enjoyed the great place to grow up as a little kid. All right, so I just see a question. Isn't this hangout meant to be on Tuesday? I was supposed to be selling, doing the closing for my house that I'm selling tomorrow, but the loan fell through at the last minute. So that's why we're having the hangout on Monday, and then we'll get back to our normal schedule with the next hangout being on Friday. So that's why we kind of had the change. Okay, we'll check the time. All right, so we'll get started in about two minutes. All right, good to see Pablo in a hangout. Right, maybe in our 30 seconds and we'll get started. People are getting logged in. Okay, just reading through some more comments here. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so you see a question, Greg, hope you and your family are doing well. We're, yeah, we're doing great, thanks. We had a nice holiday weekend. Um, how do I copy a group of effects settings applied to an analog base track in Cubase 8.5 uh, to an analog base track in a different project in Cubase 10.5? If you have Cubase 10.5, one of the things you could do is just go to import tracks from project um, so if you wanted to just come here we'll select a project and say you just want it to be uh, this particular base track or whatever track you want it to be and it would just be labeled uh, and then you could just choose not to have events and parts you could uncheck that 
And that way you could just import uh, that particular track with all of its settings and effects without any, without any problems. You could also very quickly choose to, if you had a track here that you wanted to use, you could erase the particular part. Another method would be to now come over here to right click and say save track preset. And as you save a track preset, you could give it a name. Uh, and then when you go to uh, restore track preset, you could choose to add tracks using track preset, and then you could just select your track preset there. And that way the track preset won't contain uh, the media. Um, I'm not sure if the track presets would, would include the media, but you could just kind of do that. So uh, I think the fastest way is just to import uh, tracks from project and select the project that you want to import the track from and uncheck events and parts. Okay. Okay, so just seeing a comment from Neil. Hello from Greencastle, Pennsylvania. Thanks for all the hangouts you've been doing lately. The effort's very much appreciated. Thanks for the kind words. Uh, I would like to see uh, a bit more in WaveLab when you have time. So if you have like sp just specific WaveLab questions, go ahead and ask them and we could uh, go over them in the Hangout. Um, so, but we, you know, we're, we want to be able to show kind of all Steinberg products. So you can, you know, definitely ask WaveLab questions, Nuendo questions, Halligan questions, Groove Agent questions, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Okay, so question, how do I find a tempo of an audio track I've recorded? The last time I tried, there were multiple tempos listed throughout the recorded audio. So let's go ahead and just take a look. And it could be that your tempo is fluctuating. You know, some sometimes uh, I've had, you know, some drummers get very upset when you do an, an actual tempo analysis of uh, their particular playing sometimes they're not as happy when they could see, visually see when things are going on but you know what you could do is if you have a piece of music let's say something like this where there's no alignment with the tempo is just to come over here go to your project menu so you see the click track and the music is you know there's no correlation so I'll just select tempo detection here and click analyze. And here we're just gonna do an offbeat correction. And that's the tempo map that we have for the particular file. Uh, and if you wanted to kind of align the downbeats, you could do that quite easily just by. So it, as we do the tempo detection, it adds a signature track and it adds a tempo track. So I'll just say this is where our signature track goes to 4-4. Four, four. And now we have our tempo track. So if the, you know, the track is speeding up and slowing down, Cubase may detect it as speeding up and slowing down. Um, and that's fine. And it will give you more accurate, uh, more accuracy when editing and adding other tracks and trying to have that automatically follow the particular tempo of the existing audio. Okay. So we have a question, uh, is there any way to resample in Groove Agent 5 or export uh, with applied effects from within Groove Agent 5 so that samples retain effects when you load them into another sampler. Um, you know, you could... So let me just go over here. And so we'll just do a new project.
So depending on how you've done the sampling, one thing that you might want to do is to let's, let's add an instrument track here. So we'll have Groove Agent SE. So there isn't a necessarily kind of like a built-in resampling, but let's come over here to my media menu and I'll just drag some different sounds. Let's say, okay, I'll just look for a kick. So let's say if I have a kick track, I'm just gonna drag that onto the file, onto my timeline. And let's say snare. And I'll drag this to my timeline as well. So if I wanted to come over here and have, let's say these are uh, my different audio files. The one thing that I may want to do if I wanted to include effects is to just do uh, if I have started from having the files in the timeline and we could just drag these directly to the pads themselves and as we hit play. Uh, but it, let's see if I come over here and just do like an off and if I wanted to take these particular files and do an offline processing by hitting F7. Um, so let's say if I just wanted to put like a big reverb I'll just put a big obnoxious reverb on it. So let's say, okay, so now, so let's see if I come here and that's process those particular files. Um, So that didn't carry over into our samples that were dragged. So, but if I wanted to now cut these, so let's say if I just come over here, cut the pad. So if I kind of initiate it from there, I could take the same files and kind of redrag them over. But let's just come here, say, that I have these, so if I wanted to turn these into separate audio files here, so let's just say I wanted this to go to at measure three. Let's just put in a C1. So if I have these at a uh, particular, just different MIDI notes that I wanted to, and let's come here and move this up. And I'll just draw in a D1. So at this point, what you could do is, you know, just do a render in place. And I know this is a bit of a, a workaround. So if you wanted to, um, let's say we'll just render, like if we have just the MIDI note at this point, maybe you could do, um, go to edit and just choose to render in place. this particular sound, so I'll just. So 
So at this point you could have the sound and then just do perhaps an offline processing. So, but there's not kind of a, an automatic way to render that. Um, so if I have just that sample as an audio file, uh, at this point I could do my offline processes and we could just say, you know, run it through your reverb again. And as you listen to it, and then you could just drag it directly on and replace the sample with the different effects. But there isn't kind of an automatic resample with effects. And I may be able to come up with kind of a more streamlined uh, approach than that if I play around with it a little more. But um, so that's it's may not be the most ideal situation for that. But let's move on. Uh, question, what is the best laptop for Cubase 10.5? Um, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of people, I think I was at Teddy Riley's place in the fall and he had like an i9 Asus, I think that he really liked for being able to put a bunch of drives in it and do all of his production work. Uh, I'm currently using a MacBook Pro an i9 with 32 gigs of RAM. So that works pretty well, but you know, but I have a PC that I've had so much going on seven years now, which was uh, done by uh, Music XPC out of Canada, um, and that's just an i7 with 16 gigs of RAM, and that works really well. So it's really, you know, it could be a personal preference. So, but there's a lot of great uh, options for Mac and PC that are available. Okay. keep going through. Okay. So, uh, we have a, a question, um, about Nuendo. How many Q mixes are in the control room in Nuendo? I heard there are eight. If so, I'm thinking about upgrading the Q mixes that we have in both Nuendo and Cubase are going to be set to four Q mixes. So when you go to your studio to audio connections, and this is the same in both, uh, Nuendo and Cubase that you have, you know, so you can have four independent Q mixes plus the studio mix. So that gives you kind of five Q mixes that you could send to uh, different musicians. So in that regards, there's no difference between the control room functionality in Cubase and Nuendo. So if you're going to upgrade just to get additional Q mixes uh, that you won't benefit in that regard from uh, having Nuendo over Cubase. Okay, question. The way to extract a MIDI pattern uh, and velocity to apply a set of chords or another track or project altogether. I think the Quantize does one or the other. Is there a way to do this? Um, okay, so if you wanted to extract a MIDI pattern, let me just kind of come over here and I'll just drag one over. I'll just do a quick MIDI loop. Okay, so if you have a track that's going directly out to a virtual instrument, what you could do is set it to go, uh, you could do a file export, and then you could export it as a MIDI loop. And the MIDI loop will retain the instrument and its settings. Uh, so when you, you know, as opposed to a standard MIDI file that's not automatically mapped to the correct instrument, the MIDI loop will carry over the in, the information from the particular instrument. Uh, if you have, let's say if I listen to this, and let's say I just change the velocity. and I wanted to copy that velocity, what you could do is go to your quantize setup and drag the MIDI part. So let's say I'll just copy this part here. And 
and I will just kind of do different velocity changes and this velocity will be kind of all flat. So what I could do is come over here and I could drag this particular part into the quantize panel. As we do this, um, I could set the position to be 0% and a velocity to be 100. So as I want to come over here and change just the velocity value of this setting. So I see the velocity of this. I double click on this part where all the velocities are the same. Now I hit quantize. We could now have just the velocities carried over. And then the velocities will also be included when you do uh, the export MIDI loop. So that's how you could extract velocities and apply to other parts or just simply export the track with the part itself that recalls the uh, instruments being used uh, during the pattern as well. Okay. Okay, so it says, uh, Hi Greg, does the root key function in the upper menu affect samples in the media bay in the latest version of Cubase Artist? Um, I believe it does, but you may have to set uh, the different parts. So let's say if I wanted to come over here, let's say my root key is A, and I wanted to go to maybe just a quick uh, bass part, and I'll just find maybe... <laughs> So if I drag this base into a different file, um, what you could do is you could just choose to transpose. So let's see if now we have kind of our root key in A for that particular part. Um, but you could have, and let's just make sure that we could see our root key here. And if this had kind of, you know, if you know what the root key is, so let's say this is my root key is set to A. And at this point, you could choose to transpose and, you know, and now you could. And you could have it choose to follow the different transpositions, especially when using like a transpose track, or you could have it be independent. So if it was like maybe a drum part, you may want it to be independent where it's not gonna follow those changes. So that's a little bit of information on root key and dealing with it with audio files. Okay, let's just go on through more of the questions. Hi, Greg. I was wondering why today uh, has latency introduced itself while recording my guitar via audio interface. I understand delay compensation, get rid of a lot of latency the other day. Cheers. So if you're having latency when you're tracking, let's say, a guitar part, um, so if I come over here and I add a guitar, so if you have different plugins, uh, there's two different modes that we could have for Cubase. So when we deal with this, we could have Cubase go, um, you know, where you could say, okay, I go to my audio interface and you could activate direct monitoring and you may not see this on Mac because core audio on Mac, uh, doesn't offer direct monitoring, but many of the audio interfaces do. Um, and if you have direct monitoring enabled, what's going to happen is the audio signal goes directly from the input to the output and you don't hear any of the effects. So as you're tracking guitar and many times people will go to the mix console and let me just set my visibility here so I could always have my, my output channels kind of fixed to the right. Um, so if we have effects on the master bus, I could come over here. So a lot of people will just start tracking and 
Uh, they want to have a limiter or multi-band compressor, kind of a full uh, like mastering chain. So say I wanted to have a multi-band compressor there and on my guitar part, I want it to have you know, several different guitar amps and plugins. So if I come over here, let's go to distortion, say, okay, I want the VST amp rack and I wanted to run it through another, like a multi-band envelope shaper. So when we do this, anytime that you add a plugin in your signal path, these plugins in real time, as you're listening and monitoring, can cause latency. And if we go to our mix console, to the full screen mix console view, uh, in Cubase Pro 10, you could actually just come right over here and see the channel latency indicated. So I will come right over here and you can see that on this particular track, that's gonna have two milliseconds of latency. And with the multiband compressor here, uh, we can see that the multiband compressor itself can be causing 123 milliseconds of latency. So as you as you kind of insert different plugins for monitoring during your tracking, that can cause latency. Now, one way to kind of get around this quickly is let's say if you have plugins that are causing a lot of latency, if you go during the tracking process, you have this function called constrained delay compensation. So what this could do is once this is enabled, we'll probably notice that as soon as I turn that on, this plugin will get bypassed. So because that plugin is causing a lot of latency. So you could try to just kind of toggle the constrained delay compensation on, and that will automatically go through and kind of bypass those plugins during tracking. And then you just enable it when you're not tracking and just monitoring through. So once the audio is playing back through that signal path after it's been recorded, um, that's when the latency compensation kicks in. It can't really do it necessarily before. Um, so yeah, in many audio interfaces like the UR, our, the UR24C that I'm using, so if I wanted to come over here, we'll have built-in uh, latency, uh, built-in DSP to kind of circumvent this so when i want to go to uh you know we could come over here and just kind of see different hardware settings so as i go to add a track of audio let's say i wanted this to go into this particular input and uh, we could add the track and then you could actually adjust kind of the latency as we did as we see this here so let's just say um So you could see kind of adjustments in the hardware there. So that's when some of the interfaces like the URC series or the UR interfaces, uh, everything above the UR22 Mark II has built in DSP to kind of mitigate that situation. Okay, question, how do I sync my hardware instruments to Cubase so that they play when I plus press record in Cubase. Well, you know, as, as long as you're sending MIDI data out to it, um, all you have to do is, you know, when you play the MIDI data will be sent to your hardware instruments here through like a, a MIDI track. So let's say if I add a MIDI track, um, so as we add a MIDI track, this goes out and then you could just simply pass, you know, take the audio outputs of your hardware instruments and, connect that to your audio interface and be able to record. You could also, if you have enough inputs and outputs of your audio interface, is you could set them up as external instruments. So let's say if you have a drum machine or a montage, we could connect these to available inputs and outputs of your audio interface. And then when we go to add an instrument track, we could choose for this to say, go from my Korg M1 or my montage. And then as I have MIDI data here, I could just take that particular track and I could do a render in place. And in real time, it could turn that into audio. 
Now, if you have external sequencers in the instruments, like if you wanted to synchronize the external sequencers or arpeggiators, you could send MIDI clock to those particular instruments. So if we go to your transport menu to project synchronization setup, we could send uh, where we're sending MIDI out to that particular device and we could send MIDI clock to it to have that device automatically um, be in kind of a response mode to it so that it's looking to respond to external clock. And then we could just simply uh, re hit record in Cubase and then the MIDI data from that device can be transferred over if that's for an internal sequencer. But if you're looking just to capture the audio from MIDI that's going out, that's being sent out from Cubase to your external instruments, just get a physical audio connection from a mixer or your external instruments and then just record it directly back in. Uh, and if you have enough inputs or outputs, look at doing the um, external instruments and set it up once and then you could treat it very much like a typical VST instrument. Okay, so let's move on. Okay. All right, so we have people from Asheville and we see Gareth is on the Hangout. That's good. We have Kenosha. Okay, so a uh, question I would love to see an example explaining how best to set up routing in mix console, parallel processing of an audio signal using various effects, uh, VSTs, let's say, for and automating some parameters. So, you know, there's a couple of ways to approach um, doing, you know, parallel processing. So let me just jump to another project here. And let's just go ahead and take some drums. So let's say if I want to do parallel processing on my drum track, so I will select the top drum track here and let's select uh, the bottom drum track. Um, and there's a couple different ways of doing this. One is to, uh, like if you have a Cubase artist or Cubase elements, probably the easiest way is to come here. I'm going to select all of my drum parts and then right click. Then I'm going to add a group channel to the selected channels. Okay. Um, and then I could add another, just a group channel. So right now we have two stereo group channels kind of right next to each other, group one, group two. So when I do this and I want to take all my drums, I can make all my drums louder or softer and it's being summed kind of right here. I'll quickly just kind of bring up all my drum volumes here. Just enable quick link, select the channels. So this is summing all of my different sources. I will go to my sends here. So, and what I want to do now is to send the audio, let's say, you know, to our, so I'm gonna activate Q link and or hold down Alt plus shift and I'm gonna send these also to group two. And I'm gonna turn it on so now when we play, we'll have the audio going to group one and to group two. So when I wanna come here, I could just apply like really heavy compression on one of the paths. So this one's going to be like more, has more of the dynamics. And this one's going to be more compressed. And a lot of times people may EQ this a little differently as well.
and then kind of just find that sweet spot between the two of them. So you could have one that's going to be more of the dynamic components, and then you could kind of bring and dial in the punch. So that way you're kind of processing it two separate ways. And you could automate that. So if you wanted to only be like during, during the verse or during course. And then we could just bring that down a little bit. And as we just play, So as we kind of come here, you'll see the automation for that group. So we'll see the automation for the parallel group. So that's a couple different ways that you could do automation with parallel processing. Okay. Going through different comments. Okay. Okay. My chat line jumped ahead. Just bear with me. Right, just going through different comments. Um, I think I found my space. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, okay. Just reading through. Um, Okay, so I just see a question. Uh, hi, what is this Hangout about? It's really just going to be um, answering questions that you have. So any question you have, it's not really a particular topic. Uh, it's really just kind of fielding questions from users. So, And I think a lot of people will learn different tips and tricks. All right, so we have someone from Cambodia. That's great. Okay, uh, we have a question. Is there a way to render in place in real time? Um, so there's, it's not necessarily a render in place, but yeah, we could do it. So let me just do a new project here. And you could set up some clever routing. So let's say if I wanted to go to instrument track and I just wanted to add my instrument all right so i have just a sound and what i want to do now is to take that track and i'm going to add an effects channel i'm going to add a group channel to the selected channels okay and then I'm just going to add a stereo audio track. So I'll just come right over here. Let's say stereo. Okay, so right now I play uh, my synth. And the synth is the retro log is going directly out to the group. And for this audio track, the input, I want to set it 
to group one. So now when I arm both of these, I'm kind of using the group as kind of a, a go between, if you will. I'll just kind of come over here. So what that's doing is recording both the MIDI and audio simultaneously. So as we kind of come over here. So that's how you do it. So you could just come over here, take uh, your virtual instrument, and then if you wanted to send it to a group, take that group and and take your audio input and set, set the group as the input for the particular audio track. And you could record both MIDI and audio simultaneously, which is kind of like a real-time render in place. Okay. Um, okay, it says, Hi, Greg. Uh, re regarding the old film composer trick of slicing one long MIDI note and chromatically randomizing pitches, can you instead restrict the randomized notes to harmonies on the chord track? Um, yeah. So if you're not familiar, this is kind of a, a, a great old school, you know, film composer trick. So if we have a long note here, you know, there's a couple of different ways to approach this. So, um, so let's say I have one long note and let me just quantize that to just start. Okay, so if you wanted to come here, and I'll just hide the instrument, and we'll make this note just a little bigger, a little easier to see what's going on. So let's say if I wanted to come here, um, you know, this is one measure. Let me just get it on the grid here. And I'll just set this to my quantized value. Okay. So if I wanted to split this particular note uh, and I could come right over here and I'll just hold down, you know, just make sure my snap is on. I'm going to set my grid to be 16th notes. So now I'll hold down my Alt or Option key and I will just kind of. And let's say if I just wanted to, there's a couple of ways you could do this. So if you wanted to take this entire scale here, um, we could use like a MIDI logical editor is one way of doing this. So if I wanted to go to my logical editor, I could say, we're gonna say type is equal to notes. Uh, I wanna to choose to transform. Uh, I want to take value one. Um, and so say, I think we could just come here and I want to randomize. Let's say value one, we want to set random values between let's say C1 or C3 we'll just say and C5 and then let's see, I think we could also have value two or value one to pitch. Um, we could just say transpose to scale. Uh, I want it to be, let's say C. Um, I'll just do, let's say D major. And now I could have all the notes just And those will all be, so let's say if I want to switch this to E major, we'll probably see all these notes shift. And we 
could say I want these all between C3 and C4. So let's come over here, randomize, and now it's going to be. And then you could say I wanted to take. Let me just remove that. Um, and then I think you could even just say, we want to take value two and you could set random values. Um, let's say for our velocity between 80 and 120. So now if I did this correct, we can now just have that and have different Let's do a little more extremes. Let's say 60 and 120. Apply. So those are some of the things you could do. And if you have this automatically, uh, if you have a chord track involved with this, we could just say, let's go to the chord track. And let's say I want this to be in F sharp minor. Um, then I could have this part, uh, just get a chords. And as we do this, I'll say, follow the chord track and we'll say just to the chords. And when I hit okay, you'll see that those will just change to just be compliant within the chord track. So there's a couple of different approaches that you could take for that. Um, but again, if you want to, I'll just pull up the logical editor again to give you an idea. So you can say types are equal to notes and value one we could set to, and that's pitch between particular notes here. Uh, we could transpose to particular scales and a number of different scales to choose from. And you could also choose to randomize velocities. So that's a couple of quick ways to kind of work with kind of having one, you know, starting from one long note to having a whole sequence done in a matter of seconds. Okay, uh, so I see a question. Uh, hello, Greg, everyone. Uh, question, what would you suggest to clean up a bad mix from a previous recording from effects provided in Cubase 10.2? You know, it really depends. You know, every mix will be different. Um, you know, a lot of times if you say bad effects, what that means to a lot of people is that people are using too many effects. Um, so I would try, you know, without hearing it, I would say, you know, try to use less effects overall. You know, try to be subtle with the effects. You know, don't have, you know, a lot of times when I hear stuff, you know, that sounds like it's, you know, six different reverb types for different things. And it's just kind of lacks kind of a cohesion to the particular files. So that could be tricky to kind of make work. So sometimes have, you know, bearing it down to minimum of effects. And, you know, I see a lot of people just put effects on for the sake of putting effects on and not necessarily for what's better for the particular piece of music. Um, a lot of times you may have stuff that's just kind of rumbling, like on lead vocals. Uh, so, you know, a lot of stuff, I, you know, I know many people just put, you know, high pass filters on everything except for maybe the bass and kick just to kind of free that up. And also on the effects ends, you know, so when you have an effects channel track, try coming directly over here and don't be afraid to... You know, when you go to the effects return channel to EQ the different effects, but, you know, try using less plugins, less effects. And I've always found that the songs that are easiest to mix are arranged well. So you don't have like, you know, four different keyboard parts all kind of in the same voicings, fighting with the vocal, fighting with, you know, two guitar parts, you know. So, you know, if you have a song that's kind of arranged well, they tend to mix themselves a lot easier when you have a good arrangement. So don't feel bad taking out different parts as well. But without kind of hearing it, it could be hard to give some advice. But those are a couple of things that you could uh, take a look at. Uh, 
Uh, so you see, hi from Paris question. I have up to date 10.4 uh, to 10.5 with 10.4 complete control worked well, but with the 10.5, it is not working. So if you could, if you can help, thank you. Um, so one of the things, uh, I don't have the uh, complete control, so I'm, I'm not an expert on it. But if it's kind of working with uh, 10, I, I'm assuming 10.04, uh, you know, it should be maybe the same thing with 10.5. But, you know, you may want to reinstall if there's, I think there's like a little kind of software layer that could work between the two and make sure that you have the latest version. But there shouldn't really be anything um, that should prevent you from, you know, from it working differently, but I'm not, maybe someone else could, who's using a complete control could verify. I still have like really old controllers. Uh, so my main controller, you know, I, I have a Nectar in my office. I use a lot and like quite a bit. Uh, but I didn't have to do anything differently from different Cubase versions. So, Maybe try to reinstall or see if there's an update as well. But I don't think anything really changed for MIDI communication uh, with 10.5 from 10.04. Okay, so we have our people checking in from Croatia. Let me see if, hang on one second and see if that's my son. I'm just going to get a quick movie on for my son. I'll be right back. Apologies.
I'm back. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's uh, move on to the next question. Okay, so it says, since I've done the current update, Cubase seems to crash my sound card more often. I don't have much issue before. How can I fix this? Um, make sure you have the latest sound card drivers that you're using. Um, you know, so you could see, you know, and I'm not sure which uh, sound card you have, but, you know, generally Cubase will interact the same way with this, with the audio card. So, but if you could tell us what sound card you have, that would be helpful as well. Okay, so I see question. Hi all from Sweden. I had a question about the red input faders. Is it a must to have it visible or do I need them, seeing them on my mix console? So like when I'm doing a project, you may notice that when I come over here to the mix console, that I will see the red input faders uh, because these are the inputs that are defined in my uh, my current audio connections here. So if I switch this to, let's say one stereo, that will decrease these faders. So when you'd want to see the input faders is you could attenuate the gain from your audio interface before it goes into Cubase or if you wanted to apply effects such as EQ or compression, you could apply effects. Now, no, no, be aware that when you apply effects, certain plugins, this will be at part and written into the audio file that you can't undo. Um, so that could burn those effects and permanently apply them in during the tracking process. I've used the input faders, like, you know, I've done a lot of large festival recordings, um, so I remember doing one, it was like Eric Clapton's Crossroads in, uh, in Dallas where, you know, I was recording 48 tracks and as the bands would get louder and louder, I would take all my input faders and slightly take them down in between songs. So I wasn't clipping the recording because I didn't have control from the front of house console where we were doing the split. But a lot of times you could ignore the input faders if you have the gain structure set on your audio interface. But when you don't have access to that, the input faders, you could add signal processing or apply EQs or adjust the gain to add or subtract gain directly from here before the signal is hit. If you don't need to do that, you can just simply choose to hide your input faders uh, so that they're not in the way. Okay. Okay, just reading through. Okay, so I think I'm just seeing a quick comment uh, maybe about the locators and the compass tool. So if you come here, we could just, uh, you could use to zoom, like when you're in the top timeline, or if you have this set for uh, like the left and right cycles, you can turn on and off the cycle modes here once it, when you have it with the little hand. And a lot of people were kind of frustrated because that had changed. I kind of like the behavior and can say, okay, when I'm in the lower zone, I see the compass that I could use that for zooming and to be able to turn on and off the cycle mode from there. But if that's really annoying, uh, in 10.5, there is a preference, and I think it might be under transport, or you could say clicking in lower clicking in locator range in upper part of ruler activate cycle so if you uncheck that now i can't accidentally turn oh. cycle mode oh. on and off but once that preference is enabled uh, we could choose to have it function uh, either way so you could cycle or turn on and off the left and right locators this cycle or zoom. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so it says, hi, Greg. Uh, so contact six mod wheel stopped working the other week in Cubase 10.5 Pro. I suspect it's my keyboard mod wheel. Could I use something else for a mod wheel? So let's say I have, um, you know, one way to test it is if we have uh, like an instrument track here. And you go to your MIDI inserts. Uh, there's a plugin called MIDI Monitor. So as soon as you turn that on, um, and you may have to just turn it on here, you move whatever parameters. I move my pitch bend wheel, I move my modulation wheel, I hit notes. Those will all show uh, what MIDI activity is currently going on. So if you're moving your mod wheel and you're not seeing it indicated here, then that would be indicative that um, the mod wheel on your MIDI controller isn't working. So if you have another fader, so let's say if I come here uh, for this particular track, um, I have, let's say I have a knob. So I have, and this knob is outputting controller 32 and I wanted to take that particular knob or fader on my MIDI controller. And I will come over here, I can set this to local. And when we set this to local, we could have what we call an input transformer. And here I want to activate this. And I'm gonna say, we're gonna take our filter target of, we're gonna say, um, let's say, I want to transform let's say type is going to be equal to controller and what I want to do is to have uh, my controller and we're gonna say value one so it, the knob is spitting out MIDI CC 32 so I'm gonna say subtract 31 values so now when i move this particular knob and i'll go to my midi inserts it's going to put out controller one if i deactivate let me just so if i deactivate this and move the same knob we could go to my midi inserts and as I move the knob, it's 32. So let's just see if I get this to stay open. So, but with this particular input transformer, activate it. So that's basically gonna turn it into controller one as we do that. So. You could just set up the input transformer and take any other MIDI controller and remap that to, um, you know, MIDI CC1. Okay, so see, hi Greg, there's a problem. Groove Agent 5, choose drinking habits, then choose main two, for example, drag it in instrument track and you'll see main 13 play it instead of main two why all right so let's take a look Okay, so I'll just load up this kit. And select a pattern here. Okay, so let's see. We have main two, and this is main 13. Okay. So I will just stop this and let's just, so this is more hi-hats, open hi-hat on main 13 and more of a closed hi-hat here. 
So I will drag this over. And let me just set one little thing here. Okay, so I'll listen to that again. So that sounds the same to me. It could be maybe that when you're dragging it out, you know, some of the notes that could be used for triggering the patterns as well as instruments can be shared. So you may want to just activate this uh, icon here, which is the use pattern MIDI port for pattern bank. Uh, so make sure that's turned on when you do that, but that seems to play back pattern too. I'll just listen to it one more time here. And we'll listen to the pattern here from the pattern pad. So that sounds the same. This is pattern 13, which you said was dragged over. So that sounds very different, but make sure you have this turned on and see if that makes a difference for you. Okay, I'm just reading through different uh, comments and questions. If you've learned something new, please feel free to uh, give a thumbs up to the video. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, make sure that you subscribe so you can get notified of all future Hangouts. And again, I think as of, uh, we'll be kind of back on our normal Tuesday, Friday schedule as of this Friday. So we moved Fridays up because of the holiday here in the United States. So sorry for the changes in the last week, but we'll be on our normal schedule again. Okay. Okay, so just seeing a question, let me just see if I could, about um, what's the benefit of loading Groove Agent this way? Let me just see if I could find what that's referring to from uh, Luke Williams. So uh, maybe Luke, if you could ex expand a little bit uh on on your comment about what the benefit of loading uh the groove agent this way is okay just going through Okay, just reading through comments. Um, okay, uh, hi Greg, is there a way to keep the edit channel uh, setting windows opened even when you click elsewhere or is it possible to assign a keyboard shortcut to it? Um, so if you have the edit channel window, all you have to do is you could set it to always on top. So let's say if I come right over here, I have the edit channel settings. Uh, you could just kind of right click and just uh, towards the top in previous versions, I think in 9.5 and 10, you clicked at the bottom, but that still works. So you could just activate always on top. And then as you go to do other things, you could just have that particular window uh, always present. So if you wanted to go to your drum editor, you could look at that. You wanted to uh, 
uh, go to your media bay, you wanted to open up your direct offline processing, that would always be on top. So just try to go near the top, right click and choose always on top. And let's see, I'm pretty sure there's a keyboard shortcut for this as well. So let's take a quick look. So it's probably going to be here under edit channel settings. So you could set up a keyboard shortcut and that would fall under edit. So you could assign a keyboard shortcut for that as well. But just uh, try right clicking here or right clicking at the bottom and just activating always on top. Okay, just reading through more comments. Um, so is it possible to change the MIDI track tempo? Example, performed at 120 beats per minute to your project tempo at 100 beats per minute. So let's take just this uh, groove agent part that we recorded in. So let's say if I just wanted to take this groove agent part here, and let's say I think we have this retro log thing that I did. So let's say I just want to take this and we're at 120 beats a minute. You know, if it's set to musical mode here, um, so you want to make sure that this little icon here, there's linear mode and musical mode. Um, so if it's set to, to musical mode, which is the default for MIDI, I could now just type in 100 beats a minute. And now that particular part will play at 100 beats a minute. And I'll just turn this off. So once you kind of, let's say I'll just put that track now into musical mode. So now we play. So that will automatically follow whatever tempo uh, that you want. So, you know, all you have to do MIDI, you know, usually by default will automatically just follow whatever tempo change you have. Okay, so how to turn a mono track into a stereo track without creating a new audio track. By that mean directly changing the bus settings. So if we have, um, okay, let me just do a new project here. See if there's some mono files, or it's all gonna be stereo. All right, let me just search. See if there's some mono bass. So finally we have mono file. 
All right. So again, the question is uh, how to turn a mono track into a stereo track without creating a new audio track. With I mean directly changing the bus settings. You know. So right now I have this going to my stereo out. So it's a mono track, and I could just adjust the panning. Let me just put this into a quick loop. I'll just duplicate it a couple times. So if I wanted to pan all the way to the right, all the way to the left. So while that's a mono track, um, we could just simply take that particular mono track and you know, it's panable. So just because, um, but if you wanted, if you needed to turn it into a stereo track for some reason, you could just come right over here, do a render in place. Let's go to your render settings and we could say, let's include the complete signal path. And as soon as we do that, then it will render that as, uh, as a stereo file. But you know, I'm not sure why you'd want to need to take the mono to stereo without creating a new track, but if you still have access to, you know, your panning and stuff like that, um, or if it's just maybe for, if you have, if you wanted to have like stereo guitar effects on a guitar part, um, you know, just you could just render it as an audio file or send it to, um, you know, you could also just come right over here send it to a group channel, make it a stereo group. And now if I want to put like a, a stereo delay on a mono, so say if I just want to put in a, So say if I just want to put a, put a ping pong delay and we'll go all Pink Floyd on us. So so if you're doing it for effects processing, you know, send it to a group and then be able to kind of uh, send that out, um, you know, to different effects processors if you need to. Okay, just going through some more comments here. Okay, uh, so I see, um, hello, which are the shortcuts you suggest for reverse or bounce in place? Um, you know, you could set the keyboard shortcuts anywhere that you want. So let's say if I wanted to take this, uh, let's go to your edit to key commands. Um, you know, so if we go to, you know, and if you make your own key commands, this is always kind of, you know, finding, you know, available key commands that don't mess something up. Um, so often I just kind of do multiple modifiers. So if I wanted to reverse the audio, I could just do maybe like command option control R. Okay. I had that set up for something else. So let me try a command option shift R and we can see that's not assigned to anything. So now if I wanted to do this, I could just hit process and reverse that particular audio file. So let's see. Um, so, you know, it's really just kind of, you know, setting kind of your own key commands. And then if you wanted to go to audio to bounce selection, um, you could just come right over here. And I think I have that defined from a previous hangout. So I have uh, command op command control option B. So if I just wanted to bounce these, I could select those and, and then just replace the events. And now I, I've done that. So it's really, you know, check whatever keyboard shortcuts there by default, there aren't ones assigned for that, but you could assign anything that works for you. So maybe like, you know, alt control 
shift R for reverse alt control shift B for bounce. Okay. Um, so once again, if we could try to avoid uh, asking the same questions repeatedly, that'd be helpful. Okay, um, so it says I solo a track and effects channel gets uh, gets off, uh, gets of. Then I turn on effects and I hear other channels with same effects. How to solo only one audio track with effects. So let's jump to one of your projects. So if you solo your effects, it can... Uh, you know, you, you can hear like the other tracks. So let's just jump to this project here. I turn it up, you wouldn't mind. Up until now. So even though the guitar okay. has reverb on it here. When I just solo the my vocal, I don't hear the guitar bleeding through. Our musical history laid out on the floor. I've got to choose. So it says when I solo the track and effects channel gets of um, it's probably just a typo. Um, then I turn on effects and I hear the other channels with the same effect. So as soon as I solo the channel here, what's mine and what's I don't hear the other tracks that are feeding into the same reverb return. And I think I only have one reverb in this project here. Asking Beatles or songs, something bad that just sounds so wrong. What is too but that has reverb in it, and that does too, and I don't hear the vocal. So I'll select this, and we'll add more reverb. So just soloing the track, and you know, at that point, we'll just... Whatever you do. And that kind of mutes the other tracks that are going that are sharing the same effects bus. So give that a shot. And, you know, I'm not sure if you have them as inserts or sends, but, you know, it, was, it seems to work as expected here. Okay, it says, hi, thanks for hosting these Hangouts. Are you thinking about increasing maximum VCA channels above 32? Uh, we haven't really had many requests for more than 32 VCA tracks, but let's see. So this is add 50 VCAs. So it looks like it just added 50. So let's see, our VCA tracks starts at 39. So we just count. So it looks like, uh, it looks like it's 32. I, I, I could pass it along. Um, but I, I guess there's, you know, always the use of potentially more than 32 VCAs, but, um, but I'll, I'll pass that along. Okay. Let me move on. Okay, so uh, just see, 
Um, Greg, maybe this isn't the right forum uh, for this. So maybe an offline answer would be better, but I'd appreciate any knowledge you may have on this. Is there a common link which causes Cubase crashes? Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, when we get crash reports, um, you know, we find that a lot of it's going to be third party plugins and it could be people bridging 32 bit plugins still or plugins. So a lot of it comes down to a lot of third party plugins that causes crashes of what's going on. So, you know, you could always send crash reports into the company, into, you know, your support request form. Um, from your Mike Steinberg account, but generally, you know, we've noticed like a significant decrease in crashes when we kind of went with 64 bit and using VST three plugins will be inherently more reliable as well. So if you have the option of running the 64 bit VST three version of the plugin that will, you know, greatly increase reliability in your, in your, uh, setup as well. Uh, so a question from Taylor is a, is there a plugin in Cubase that can split multi bands and send each band to a different channel or group without having to duplicate tracks and add multiple plugins to one track? Um, okay. So there, there isn't kind of an automatic way of doing that. Uh, what a lot of people will do is, you know, if they need to just take particular frequencies, so let's say if I wanted to come to the drums, and what I see a lot of people will do is kind of come over here, and if they wanted to, if they need to split something out of a stereo source, kind of based on frequencies, is just kind of using... Uh, the, you know, coming over here and just using maybe like a multiband compressor and this way or one of the multiband. And then at that point you could, let's just come back here. You could just kind of bypass. Or just solo particular frequency ranges. And then you're able to send that, but nothing that could then kind of pass that into different. But if you wanted to just quickly render, you know, set up your different bands. So say this one, I want it to be mostly my snare, let's say in this band. You know, you could render out a track with that setting, with just a kick setting, and maybe with just one that's gonna be just kind of more of the hi-hat oriented, but there isn't anything that kind of automatically splits the frequencies in Cubase, but there may be some third-party plugins that do that. Okay, how do I make it so my default version when double clicking to open a project I tried open with, but only options are 9.5 in other programs, uh, 10.5 not listed in other programs. One of the versions, uh, if you're on Windows, there's one of the, maybe I forget which model, which version number of Windows kind of broke that particular feature where you could select just a particular uh you know, file and easily kind of right click and say open with Cubase Pro 10.5. Um, so, you know, it's at this point, it's a bit of a little bit of a Windows bug. Um, so I, I'll play around with it, Taylor, if you want to email me or reach out to me after the Hangout to see. But I think we covered this in a previous Hangout and it was one particular Windows build 
that kind of introduced that where you couldn't set it to anything else. And it's not just for Cubase. It's, you know, pretty much for uh, just about any any uh, program file that does the file associations. But I'll play around with it more if you want to give me, uh, if you want to reach out via email or Facebook. Okay, hello, uh, just in Cubase does not yet um, function to extract all arrangements of full instrumental track. How does Studio One? Um, all right, so I, yeah, I think it's maybe a comment to another point. Okay, so it's just saying comment from Agent K. If you appreciate Greg's helping us, hit the thumbs up. That's always appreciated. Thank you. All right. Okay, uh, so it says... Um, Okay, can you tell me how to audition my own drum wave in the media section to the right? Uh, it'll come up with Cubase drums, etc., but not my own drum sounds in my computer. So you could navigate to anywhere. So let's say we go to the media tab. We could come over here to file browser. And once you had the file browser open, you could look anywhere on your computers. So you could just say, okay, I want to go to this particular library, whatever you wanted to, and navigate to any project. So let's say, you know, I wanted to go to users. I will say, let's go to documents, to projects. And let's say I want to go to Let's say I just now want to navigate to these particular projects. I can now just navigate and play any file. So, and when you come over here, if you wanted that to be like, if you always wanted to be able to go to a particular folder, right click and click on add favorites. And then at that point you could just say, I want to go to my user favorites and you could navigate directly to any zone. So again, once you're in the media menu, you just go to file browser and you could find any file that's on your system and be able to audition it in the media bay quite easily. All right, good to see Jazz Dude on a Hangout. He's always very helpful with helping people with comments who are way ahead of me in the, t in the chat discussion. Okay. Okay, uh, it says, how do you use multiple beat agents and groove agents so that in jam state you can mix and match uh, different patterns? Currently, it looks like you can only click on the same pattern for each agent. So this is with the full groove agent version. So I'll show you the little trick. So uh, when the groove agent first came out, I think version four, you could switch the patterns for... Um, you know, to the same pattern across all of the agents. Uh, but there's a little trick you could do in a full groove agent. So if you have different patterns going on, so let's say I wanted to have uh, maybe kind of like a beat agent going on. Let's say I have kind of like a beat and I want it maybe like an acoustic drum. So I will load a pattern, uh, load kit with patterns here. So All 
right, so let me just. I'll say just kind of maybe like fusion. Okay, and let's load up just a, a percussion agent here. So let's say I have different patterns going on here. Okay. So let me just go past the song here. Okay, so as we're kind of playing along here, we'll just Play all of these, and I think I have a fade out maybe at the end of my project. Okay, so when we go to our pattern, um, and let's go to our pattern overview. So we can see global pad settings for pattern mode. So now if I change one of the patterns, they will all change. But if I deactivate this little G, I could now play back this particular pattern. And I wanted this pattern for this agent. And this pattern for So uh, let's just kind of go to the mixer here and go to our agents. So at this point, um, so you, when you go to the pattern editor, disable this G here, and then you could switch between your different patterns. So let's say I want to switch patterns here. And I want it to switch to different pattern while keeping the beat agent the same. And I want to have a different pattern on that. So just try just to disable just this little G here, and then you can have independent patterns for each agent. Okay. Okay, uh, Greg, I'm trying to record samples. How can I remove noise from room tone, preamps, mics, etc.? Is there an isotope RX solution that's built into Cubase Pro 7? Probably the best solution for that. Um, so there isn't one that's included, but you should really kind of maybe check out like what you could do with um, one of the solutions that Steinberg is that offers is when you come over here is doing uh, spectral layers. Uh, and this would allow you to take different room tones and be able to mask it. Um, so you could kind of see like what your audio waveform is 
and be able to race. This isn't included with Cubase. It's an add-on purchase. Um, but this is kind of a very surgical approach uh, for uh, what's going on for, you know, getting rid of room tone or buzzes or noise floor, stuff like that. So really kind of check out the different uh, spectral layer options. Okay, so I probably destroyed this song enough. Let me revert it. Okay. Okay, so it says, Hi Greg, on a header in Cubase where you see the file, edit, audio, etc. Mine, Cubase 9.5, it's really dark and hard to see. How can you lighten it up um, so that you can read it better? So probably the menu options here. Um, depending on, you know, I think it could be based upon, you know, I think if you're using it in Windows 7, that it could be kind of a Windows 7 thing and you might, you could try to set it to arrow mode. Um, so you could try try setting it to arrow mode in Windows 7 if you're running Windows 7. I think with Windows 10, which is what, uh, you know, the later, I think with Cubase 10 and 10.5 are really kind of geared towards 10. But it could be just uh, try setting it to like an arrow theme and see if that makes a difference. But, you know, it was something that I, I remember seeing in Windows 7, but, you know, wasn't uh, as apparent in Windows 10. So it says, I uh, used to be a Cubase user back in the day and ended up going to Studio One. Anyone think I made a mistake? Uh, yeah, I think you did. So there's a lot of great stuff that's in Cubase and, you know, probably many Cubase users aren't checking out a Studio One, um, you know, Hangout if they even have them. So, Okay, so just saying, hello, dear, but in Cubase, it's not yet functioned to extract all the chords of a full instrumental track. Um, so it, it doesn't do that currently, so. Okay, seeing lots of discussion of Texas barbecue, so. Okay, so a uh, question is maybe to one of our earlier topics when recording live guitar track to compensate for latency. Can you use the track delay clock to compensate for latency with effects on a track? Not really, you know, that's, you know, what that's going to do that's really intended more for existing tracks, you know, if, you know, and it gets to be kind of a physics thing where, you know, if you have plugins that cause latency during the tracking, the guitar will record at the right time, but what you're hearing will be delayed because of the latency uh, at, that are imposed by the effects. So, you know, try to monitor without the effects, try to record without the effects. And if it's affecting the performance, some people naturally compensate for latency when they sing or when they do drum parts or play guitar parts. And they know how to do it, but know that the track is being recorded correctly, but you're just hearing it out of time and try to come up with a solution that will allow you to, um, you know, maybe not use those different effects or try to just, again, turn on the constrained delay compensation and that will help you. But it's really just, you know, adjusting the playback position of the track when it's, you know, it gets to be kind of, again, just a physics thing where it takes, you know, certain plugins a certain amount of time to process. And, you know, a lot of plugins may have a live mode to alleviate that issue. Uh, but if the plugins are causing latency, shifting your record time in Cubase, that's really for the playback and not for the recording. Okay. It 
So just saying comment from Robbie Bowling. I didn't hear this, but uh, I guess Charlie Daniels passed today. I got to mix his band once in at Nashville uh, hmm. during a festival. I got to do recording for him for a set. So I got to meet him. He's a nice guy. Sorry to hear of his passing. Okay. And just saying, comment that uh, someone switched for drag and drop to in our program. So I think you'll see that, you know, just about all the different Cubase functions are very drag and droppable. So if you wanted an instrument, you just drag and drop. If you wanted to add plugins on tracks, you could just kind of come right over here. So let's say you have your VST effects track. And if you wanted to just drop a filter in on that track, you could do that. Or if you wanted to drop an effects channel track, drag and drop, take any of your audio files from your pool window here. So let's just jump back and say, okay, I want my loops here. And again, just drag and drop directly to your file. So if you left Cubase for drag and drop, I think you'll see that it really probably offers more drag and drop capability than other programs. So check it out. And I, if you look at the uh, Greg Ondo Cubase Q&A video series on Cubase, there's kind of a whole drag and drop uh, video as well. So you should check that out. Okay. Um, so uh, I see a question. Do you recommend any online training for beginners? You know, it's like really just kind of tackle one task at a time, you know, figure out what you want to do on record my guitar. I want to make a drum part and uh, figure out how to do that because, you know, someone's beginning course could be completely irrelevant to what you want to accomplish. So my suggest my suggestion, and there's going to be a zillion videos available. There's lots of great stuff on the youtube.com slash Cubase that's free. That's a wonderful resource. You know, there's probably just from this year alone, maybe over 120 hours, maybe, maybe close to 150 at this point of doing like these types of hangouts where, and they're going to be indexed. So you could search for particular things. So, you know, just figure out, I want to do this today, learn that. I want to figure out how to do, get better at MIDI editing or how to do scoring or making a beat and just kind of, you know, look for particular videos on that because what's kind of a beginner's course for you, for someone else may not be as applicable for you. Okay. Okay, so you see, Greg, could you please show how to fine tune correct pitch and audio? Thank you. So let's say if I wanted to do like a vocal tuning, I could, you know, there's two different ways. So if I want to do vocal tuning here, uh, I'll just revert this again. You know, we have very audio. So if I wanted to take this, I could double click and go directly into my very audio editor and it could do its own analysis of my audio files here. So I'll just kind of zoom in and out. So let's say if I wanted to do like some, you know, just different vocal edits here. So if I wanted to, you know, do just quick correction, all these notes, you know, you can set the smart controls here. I usually set them to all. And then at this point, you could just go to the bottom center and then you could adjust the tuning. You may also run into different notes where, so let's say just listening to that. So we have like just that little sibilance there. So if I wanted to join those notes, I could go to the edge and click on the glue tool. And then if I want to just move this little diamond, I could grab this point and just kind of bring that down to minimize that, that 
at the very end, a little sibilant T. I turn it up, you wouldn't mind. Up until then, that was okay. So, you know, those are some things you could do for fine tuning if you wanted to, you know, adjust a vibrato. Also, if you have like a note that's in the middle of different phrases, let's say like this note here. Um, up into you may want to adjust like just the vibrato, uh, but sometimes the transitions are really critical to sounding natural. So if you grab kind of like the little triangle here in the corner, we can just kind of adjust, move that. And then when I straighten the pitch, it won't affect those transitions. Uh, if it's on like a, if you know, if you wanted to thicken something up or just kind of do just a little bit of tuning, um, so let's say if I want to take this guitar part, you could also transpose. So I will just come here. So let's say I select this audio file. So I could transpose that just from the info line. But let's say if I have this guitar part here. And I have these two, let's say I have these two kind of panned. Um, so I think these are basically just duplicated and panned. So let's say I'll just, I'll duplicate this particular track here. So I will take this and let's say I want to pan this the opposite way. So if I wanted to take just this one, I could just do by sense or semitones. And then you could add kind of like a very subtle chorusing just by adjusting the fine tuning in real time. Yeah, if you go too much, that could be a little annoying where the pitches are fighting, but a little bit amount, maybe like around six or seven is pretty nice. And if you want to hear that by itself, So th those are some tips and tricks for using fine tuning and tuning. So and thanks for your question, Ram. Okay, so I see a question. Hey, hey, Greg, I have a problem and hope you can help me out. I want the pre-rack in the mix console to be shown by default. However, if I select it under racks, it won't stay in other projects. The mixer configuration will um, will be preserved, kind of, you know, if you will be preserved per project. So, you know, uh, settings that you make in one will automatically will not automatically carry forward. In other projects, if you always want the pre section, so let's come over here to my racks and we'll make sure that my pre section is active. So, you know, but one of the things that you could do that might be saved is if you come over here, you could have different configurations. So, let's say I want to call this uh, pre. And then I wanted to have that pre-section hidden and I just wanted to see inserts. So let's come over here to add a configuration and let's say inserts. So now when we kind of come right over here, I click on pre, I could have kind of pre-configured views and I think that these are global. So that way you could save just your pre, save your inserts, save your sends, save direct routing. So if I wanted to close this and I wanted to see uh, just my sends, I could come right over here, add another configuration and sends. And let's say if I go to my racks and I wanted to see Q sends, I could close my Q sends here or close my normal sends and see Qs. Let's add configuration cues. 
So just very easily, and you could set these up from different keyboard shortcuts so you can see exactly what components that you want. But you know, it could help if you start with a template and this information for future project will, projects will be stored in different templates. I'm pretty sure that this might be global. Um, so this may not be project specific. So let's say if I go to, um, I'll just test it here and make sure. Oh, looks like it might be stored per project. Um, but if you're starting off with a template and use a template, then you could have the same kind of foundation for all of the other projects. So um, so there's a couple of things you could do. So try starting with a template and see if that makes, uh, if that will, that way every time you start a project that will be kind of a known entity. So sorry about that. Okay, my chat timeline just jumped way ahead. Let me just bear with me while I get back. Lots of questions for me to answer. All right. I may have lost some questions, but I'll just kind of go on from as far as I could go back. Um, okay, uh, so I see a question. How did I separate the stereo out channel strip from the rest of the channels in your mixer? Hello from Seattle. So if I always want like a my stereo out channel to be fixed on the right-hand side, you could go to visibility or just go to visibility here and then click on zones. Uh, scroll down and you see my input output channels. So if I wanted a channel to always be fixed on the left hand side, I could click in like the little left hand circle or in the center or on the right hand side. Now as I scroll that my master fader will always be visible here regardless of whatever channels I have. So you could have like the lead vocal anchored to the left, um, the master anchored directly over to the right. So that's how you could separate. So again, in the inspector, click on visibility and then directly below, then click on, instead of track, click on zones. And then you could anchor tracks to the left, center or right. Okay, so you just see, hi Greg, uh, any things about render as loop options like in Ableton? Uh, not too familiar with that, but I think, you know, if I have an audio file here, so let's say if I just wanted to drop that in, you know, we could, I could select just a region here. Um, and then if you know you wanted to, if this was had its own timestamp for an audio file, you know, you could just come right over here and just say bounce selection. You could replace, and then that could be a loop that will automatically follow different tempo changes and stuff like that. But I'm not familiar with it, what the render is loop option offers. So maybe if you get a chance to, uh, include that in a later in the discussion i may, might be able to catch it towards the end of the hangout 
Okay, question, is there any option to rename the different blocks in the Ranger track uh, instead of just A, uh, change it to verse one? So let's say if we have an Arranger track here and we want to rename the different components. So as we put it in, we'll see A, B, C, D, E, F. So when we go to our Ranger track and to the inspector, so if you hold down just the alt or option key, you could label it intro verse course, whatever. So just hold down alt or option and double click and give it a name. Okay, so just seeing uh, maybe a comment about like a reverb on soprano sax or really, you know, check out the reverence. I may have missed it in part of the chat discussion that uh, disappeared on me. Okay, so I see a question uh, in the stereo sample editor for a stereo clip. Can you change the envelope gain respectively for the left and right channels? So currently it's going to be the envelope gain would be for both channels. If you wanted to do that, you could just, you know, take the particular track here easily and just go to your project uh, to convert tracks. And then you can say, you know, multi-channel to mono and then just kind of split that and just, you know, at that point you could have different envelopes for each of them. But in currently the sample editor is going to be applied to both channels for gain. Okay. Uh, another problem I've stumbled across within the media bay is, is there a way to create an a own attribute that works like Cubase character attribute? Can you somehow edit the predefined ones? So if you're in your media bay here, um, and let's say I'll just go to like the full media bay by hitting F5. So you want to make sure that you have the right section. You'll see this little icon here in the upper right hand corner. And then you'll see, um, this little settings wheel. So do that. And you can see a number of different attributes that maybe aren't currently active, but if you wanted to make your own attribute, click on the plus sign. Uh, and then you can say, I want it to be a number, text, yes, no. So let's say you did the, you know, I got, you know, 4,000 drum loops for $4 on Black Friday. You could just do, okay, display name. And you go through and you say, okay, all these drum loops uh, are good or they suck. So you could just say, let's do our display name as sucks. And we'll say yes, no. Uh, and then you could come down here to under various. And now when you go to your different attributes, at this point, you could have your own user attribute that you could say yes, no to, or search by text. So click on the settings here, then click on the plus sign, and then you could add your own user attributes in Media Bay that you could use for searching. Um, so just seeing, uh, regarding chord pad, my version of Cubase does not, uh, how the different possible forms of a chord on a chord key others have it. How do I save them? So let's say if we jump back to our chord pads here. Okay. So, um, So, so a chord pad, my version of Cubase is not how the different possible forms of a chord on a chord key others have it. How do I show them? So it could be that maybe when you hover over that you would see like the different um, chord voicing. So let me just come over here to, I think I have a project that might show this.
So now when I kind of come here, you may have to hover over to get like different voicings or different inversions. So I'm not sure if that's what you mean, but you know, it could be that you may not see it until you hover over. And then you could get different voicings or inversions. So, but if I'm misunderstanding, Ray, just uh, leave a comment or send me an email at clubcubase at steinberg.de. Uh, hi, Greg. Is Steinberg going to make it possible in Cubase to print full path when doing multi balance right now? It's only track processing. So, if you so currently, if you do the multi export, um, you know, if you do the batch export through your audio mix down, that will, uh, you know, be dry. But what you could do if you had a number of uh, events is just you could select all of your tracks if you want it to, and then do uh, from your edit menu, just do a render in place. And here you could just come over here and say, okay, I want these to be dry. I want them as one event, block events, separate events. I want the complete signal path. And you could take all of your different audio files and have them uh, automatically make stems that will be carried over with the full complete signal processing. Okay. Okay, so um, let's see, question, I'll just do this again about MIDI faders. So the question is, um, hope you and yours are well. In 10.5, when I move a MIDI fader in the mix console, all drum outputs go silent. Is this a familiar 10.5 behavior using battery four? Seems like a uh, user error to me. So I think it's kind of intended. So let's say if I have uh, my drum part here, so I will, let's get to my mix console. So I have an input and an output. I'll add my instrument track. So let's say if I, uh, I'll come over here to my VSTIs and I'll add a rack. So we'll say Groove Agent SE. So this will create the virtual, this will create the return channel for the instrument. And now I'm gonna create a MIDI track for it. So I will come over here, let's load the kit. And let's say, do some nice. All right, so we see that I'm gonna have my virtual instrument output here. But if I adjust my MIDI volume, so it'll kind of be default by zero. Um, but if you set the MIDI volume to zero, it could reflect that change for you. So what you want to do is just make sure, you know, because if you're writing MIDI CC7 for volume changes, that's why you have, this is your MIDI volume, your MIDI CC7. And if you touch it after doing that, then it's going to give you a value of zero. So you have kind of both together. So, but this won't really kick in until you touch it. So a lot of people just will choose to filter out MIDI channels. So you could say, I don't want to see that. So it's never in a way or confusing. And you're just doing kind of just the actual groove agent track there for your master output. So, but if you send a MIDI CC7 message and you take the volume down on that, the instrument should, you know, basically should go down to zero. And, but, you know, being that's a virtual instrument, you have the virtual, the virtual audio output of the instrument and the MIDI volume together. Those two can sometimes work against each other if you accidentally get the wrong one. And that's why you may want to just consider maybe filtering out the MIDI channel from the view. Um, so a lot of people may write MIDI CC7 
in like you know it's very common for composers to write MIDI CC7 in the parts themselves but maybe not have it um as actual uh like a mixing fader per se but maybe with with a you know a a software fader here in the mix console but they may write it in with like a MIDI fader into the part itself so, so the behavior makes sense but if it's confusing just hide the MIDI channels in the mixer okay Okay, just reading through comments here. Thanks for all the great discussion. If you've learned something new, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to the uh, channel if you're not subscribed. Okay, so we see uh, back to the chord pad. How do I make the chord keys show different inversions? So let's come over here. Let's get to our chord pads and when we go to enter in the chords, like say, let's do a C, uh, you know, C minor chord with G in the bass. So you could just kind of click on, and we have it now going out to Groove Agent to do that. But if you click on the left hand handle here, you could just define the different chord inversions uh, just like that. Okay, so kind of more on the topic, please, please. How can I solve latency problem when I record? So you want to make sure, you know, the first thing is your audio interface will have a buffer and a buffer will determine the latency as you're recording. So when you go to your studio setup, under your studio menu, select your audio interface and you could probably access most of them from the control panel and there you could set the buffer the lower the buffer, the lower the latency, but the harder your computer works. So if you're recording onto like a project that your computer is almost maxed out on, you may have to raise that buffer. So that will minimize the delay you hear when tracking. Many interfaces will offer direct monitoring. And if you have direct monitoring, enable that, and that will allow the signal the input signal directly as it comes in to be routed directly to the output of the audio interface. You're not gonna hear any effects, but that will be basically often be what people call direct or zero latency monitoring. If you need to record and you're monitoring through effects, make sure that when you go to the mix console, if you could bypass the particular plugins that you have in the master fader, if you have like multiband compressors and limiters and other types of mastering types of processes in here, do that after you've done the tracking and bypass those. If you have latency because your recorded input, your audio channel itself, when we come here, has a number of different effects on it, try to bypass as many of those effects that you don't need to record the part. Um, and if you have a lot of plugins that are causing latency during your tracking, come right over here and you'll see this constrained delay compensation in the lower left-hand corner of the transport. Try activating that and that could bypass plugins that are causing latency. So if you do those things, that will really help out um, with your tracking with different latencies. Okay. Okay, Greg, please enlighten me on SysX and Cubase. Um, so SysX is kind of very dense MIDI information that could be very kind of exclusive. It's often SysX is short for system exclusive, and those are kind of proprietary messages to different MIDI devices. You may send, you may hear, hear the term SysX dump, and that's often when you have everything configured in a particular patch or keyboard or drum machine. And what a SysX dump is, it's kind of like dumping all of the memory out of that particular instrument into as MIDI information. So when you open up that track, play the SysX back, it can recall the state of the instrument. Some older synthesizers, uh, like I'm looking at my Roland JD-800 above me, 
um, when you move a fader on a particular uh, slider to edit the sound and modify and change the sound on, on, a, on an instrument like a Roland JD-800, all of those would spit out SysX messages. A lot of them, a lot of the, and the SysX messages can be very dense down the MIDI stream. So it could clog the MIDI stream as you do that. A lot of instruments now, you know, we don't require SysX because they're in software or we try to control them through MIDI CC messages, which isn't nearly as much data. If you are trying to record and playback SysX in Cubase, by default, it may be filtered out. So if you go to your preferences, go to MIDI, to MIDI filter and make sure that SysX is unchecked if you need to play back or record SysX data. So it's not as widely used, um, but it was kind of a way to, you know, do a SysX dump of all of your external keyboard modules so that all the sounds would be loaded up, but it could be problematic that SysX didn't, you know, because the information was so dense going down a MIDI cable, that people would record, you know, a measure for SysX dumps for each device just so that it wouldn't conflict. And at that point, you know, um, it often wouldn't load correctly back into the device. So you may have to do it two or three times. So that's just kind of a little overview of SysX uh, and how you could get it to work in Cubase. Okay, hey Greg, is there a way of audio mix downing both mono and stereo at one go? So let's say I have my groove agent here. So I think I still have some of my groove agent parts. So let me just... All right, so let's say I have this and I've dragged that particular pattern to my project here. So let's say I want it to start right at bar one. And I want it to do mono and stereo outputs of this file. So let's say I'm playing this. So what I want to do is to just go to my audio connections and let's go to my outputs and I'm just gonna add a mono out. I'm not even gonna have it connected anywhere. And now at this point, what I want to do is go to my export to audio mix down and I could say, let's do, I'll select multiple and I can say, let's do a mono out and a stereo out. I will come to my sends and I'll just send it to a mono out here. Okay, let's export, create back into the same project. And I'll give it a name that's unique. Just do it based on locator. Sorry about that. So then you can see I have my stereo file here and mono. So, and if you have a multi track that you have, like, you know, you have stereo and mono files what you want to do is just go to your audio connections and have just a stereo and a mono output. They don't have to be routed anywhere. Set the mono tracks to the mono bus. So you can say, I want this going out of the mono bus. Take your, you know, so let's say this is our stereo. I want this going out of my stereo bus. And then I want this mono to go out of the mono bus, and then you could export mono and stereo simultaneously. OK, 
Okay, let's move on. Okay, it's okay. And once again, I just kind of seeing the same questions repeated uh, over and over again. So if we could try to avoid that, that'd be helpful. Kind of makes going through the chat fields easier. So as we mentioned before, so you know, Cubase doesn't automatically do chords detection from audio, so doesn't do it at this point. Uh, but many of them have problems with doing complex chords from audio. Okay, just saying comment uh, about the complete control from earlier. With complete control, after any update or change, always first open as a standalone. This usually solves many problems, especially when seeing new sounds or updating user presets. Okay. Okay, uh, so see, question. Sorry, Greg, I had asked earlier how to fix a bad mix from a previous recording. My question is not that effects were bad recording, but the sound is flat and no thump to it. Um, when I try to compensate for it, it gets loud. How can I fix this? I mean, it's, it's really hard to give advice on a mix that I haven't heard, but you know, if it's, you know, you could definitely try EQing. If, if you need thump to it, you could also try some dynamics uh, experiment. Like maybe on a bass, you know, if you're looking for thump, um, maybe on a bass and kick, uh, experiment with the um, the envelope shaper plugin could really help with with different stuff like that. Um, so th those are a couple of things, but it's kind of like commenting on a painting I've never seen. So, all right. All right. Okay, it's just going through different comments. Okay. Yep. Sorry, I didn't. Just uh, seen comments where I was out for the getting a movie set up for my son. So, okay, just reading through comments. Okay, so um, just seeing, hi Greg, uh, off topic a bit, what's the easiest way to have an edited audio clip to be saved to your library in Media Bay? Um, so you could have, you know, it's it's really any audio file is, is accessible. If it's on your computer hard disk, you know, it's accessible through Media Bay just by going into like your file browser. So, uh, you don't have to do anything special. You just kind of go to your media bay here. You can go home and just go to your file browser. And if you know that you particularly like these, you know, this particular folder, you know, right click and choose add favorites. Uh, and then if you need to get to it quicker, you could just come right over here to your favorites folder. And then you could see all the files that you want to quickly, but any audio file that's on your system, you could access in Media Bay. Okay. 
Okay. Um, so just seeing comment from Ambient Dave. Hi, Greg. I used a MIDI monitor tool. Forgot to, forgot to add, but mod wheel is 88 to 127, not 0 to 127. So then it might be something with, you know, maybe a setting in the controller keyboard that's limiting it or something wrong with the controller keyboard if it's not doing the full range. But generally, those things are either they work or they don't. And it's not going to, I would say if it's limited to 88 to 127, see if you see that with all different parameters or all different instruments if you just load up a midi track that's not routed out to anything and see if you see the same range um but if it's only doing 88 to 127 i my guess would be it's a setting in a controller that's limiting it um but i guess it could be maybe the controller could be going bad but you could try doing some of the um you know some of the uh MIDI input transformer functionality that we showed earlier. Okay, so question, how can I sync its tempo with my Roland Phantom G6 keyboard? So probably your Roland needs to be uh, set to sync to Cubase. So if we wanted to uh, come over here, we could, you know, again, go to your transport menu. So if you have an internal sequence in your Roland Phantom, you'd probably just need to send MIDI timecode or MIDI clock and just tell it where it's connected. Tell your uh, Phantom G6 keyboard to look for incoming MIDI clock or MIDI timecode from this particular port or tell it to or you don't have to define a port in the roland but just tell it to look for external clock and then when you come over here make sure that you have your sync set up so at that point you want to just synchronize cubase hit play and the midi clock will send the tempo information and we'll play um and we'll play back your g6 keyboard in sync Okay, so I just seen a comment about the mod wheel keyboard from Ambient Dave. Thanks, Greg. I'm going to investigate more of the same issues with my other DAWs. So I'm sure it's the keyboard mod wheel. All right. So it's what it could be something set with that, but also make sure that the keyboard itself, sometimes you may be able to set or fix ranges. Okay, just reading through. Okay. Um, okay, so I just see a chord pad question. My pads don't show the different possible forms of a chord. So again, once you kind of come over here to the chord pads, you know, you could, so if it's a B7 chord, you could have, you know, the B7 chord uh, playback, you know, different, you know, so while this is an F sharp minor chord, this will play back. Uh, when we come right over here, this will play back different voicings of the same chord. If you wanted to do different tensions, like ninth, sixths, and sevenths, you could do that. And for each of the tensions, you could have different voicings. And then you could come right over here and just click on the left side and you could define find different types of chords just like that. Okay. 
Okay, so once again, if you you know have a question, you know just repeating it over and over again um, doesn't help get the question answered. Just kind of makes everything a little slower. So if we could try to avoid that, that'd be appreciated. Okay. Okay, just reading through comments. Okay. Okay, just again, seeing a lot of repeated questions. Um, okay, hey Greg, how about having a function that minimizes the edit window and jumps it to the corner of the screen? Um, you know, you could, you know, so if you wanted to, you could probably just set that up as a workspace. So let's say if I'm here, You know, I could set this up as, let's say, a project workspace. So I'll add a workspace. I will say small edit. And let's say I'll just have this as And I'll come over here to my workspaces and let's say add workspace and we'll make it a project workspace and let's say score. And let's say if I wanted this to be normal, I'll add a workspace here. So now as I go to workspaces, like I say, there's my score, here's my small editor, here's my normal. So you could set up workspaces often to do that type of stuff. All right, hang on, my son is, I think needs a new movie. Let me see if I get, get him going. I, I'll be right back.
Sorry about that, I'm back. Okay, so let's take a look. Okay, so I see a question. What synth is Retrolog trying to go for emulating? It's not really emulating anything. It's kind of its own unique uh, instrument. So, but ironically, there's hardware synths that are emulating the software Retrolog. I think they're announced last year at Music Mesa. So it's probably one of the first software since it's had a hardware emulation of. Okay, hi Greg, this is Orrin Bynum. Good to see you, Orrin, on a Hangout. Miss seeing you at the Club Cubase in, at Washington Music. Uh, does Cubase 10.5 have anything that will make my single voice track sound like a choir sound? I'm trying to avoid making several duplicate tracks of a single track. So let's take a look. There's a couple plugins that may work. So let's say if I wanted to come here and we'll play this. So let's take our lead vocal here. And one of the plugins I would try under modulation, uh, I think it's under modulation, it's gonna be Cloner. And let's just say I'll do four voices. Wished it all away. And I'm left you for a thousand years and a day. You were the party, the big event. I was so I'd say that's just dry. And now we could kind of harmonize, kind of assimilate four voices. So as you... So just kind of bring that in slightly. So try to four voices. So I would play around with, you know, check out the cloner plugin and like, there's a lot of different presets in there, but just I did four voices and that was a nice effect, I think. So I would give that a shot. Okay, it says also another problem, is there any way to add own attributes to the predefined attributes like subcategory in the media bay? And can you have own attribute with multiple values like character? So, so let's go back to our media bay here. Um, So again, it's just, you could kind of just have it search for the user definable text. Um, but I don't know if there's a way to add into categories, um, like all the categories or subcategories, but you could again, create, you know, just clicking on the plus sign and being able to uh, have your own, you know, user definable function. So I think, you know, that will get you where you want to go. All right, just seeing other people recommend it cloner as well. Uh, 
Uh, so see question. Hello, Greg. Sometimes my MIDI input plays back a delay in playback, but happens sometimes after playing uh, after 20 minutes. What could that be? I use Army Hammerfall PCIe card. Um, so sometimes, you know, I would try to just out of curiosity. Sometimes, you know, I've seen I'm not sure if you're using the Army as your MIDI interface or not. Uh, but sometimes, you know, some, some MIDI buffers could get full. So maybe if you go to MIDI and just try to do a reset, um, see if that makes a difference when you get to that point where maybe it's playing a little bit late. Um, so try just to go MIDI to reset and see if that makes a difference. All right, so you see, hi Greg, how do you how to use e drums as a controller for Groove Agent Five? Okay, so I think I have Groove Agent here. Um, so once we're in the instrument, you'll see this little, it's a very demure icon. This looks like a drumstick hitting a pad. So if you click there, you could assign uh you could have default but you could have an e drum controller and which i think is the roland mapping and then you have a yamaha uh controller here but once you have this turned on you could just kind of right click and just do edit learn midi trigger note and hit the pad and then at that point you could just capture the midi note that's coming in from the pad itself so uh, when you're in the instrument just click here on this icon and you can say use hardware controller mapping. You could right click to edit, learn the trigger node, assign the trigger note, or use different presets here. Okay. okay. Reading through different comments. Okay, again, just reading through comments. I see Jazz Dude helping people. It's always appreciated. Okay, just okay. So, just see a question. The most video clips I load in are lagging, and I can't see them as once. Is there a problem to fix this? Thanks, Cubase Pro ten point five. You know, you you know, with video clips, it's you know, unlike audio files, which a lot of us that are doing work in programs like Cubase are kind of very familiar with, you know, video clips can really, you know, like a video f file uh, could have the same extension and be completely different based on a container and codec that you're using. So you may want to make sure, and if you just look for like optimal, there's a Google document for optimal video settings, but try using like a ProRes H.264 file for the container and the codec. So you could have the same exact uh, file name, like a .mov, or you know, it could be like a thousand different versions within the .mov file. So really just kind of make sure that you have, and you could check to make sure that you have setting up stuff, you know, that the codec and container are kind of optimally set for Cubase. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, so we covered electronic drums already. Um, so you see a question, how to use FL Studio as a VST. So I believe it will just show up as a VST instrument. So you should be able to just right click, uh, add track. I don't have it installed in my system, but you should see FL Studio in your list of plugins and you could just load it up. Okay, so just seeing, are there different display options for the chord pad? So again, when I kind of come over here, so if you wanted to see not only, you know, different options here, but if we go to uh, your settings here, you could just, uh, I think it might actually, let me see if this got moved into here. So if you go to chord pads here, you could have, you know, different remote setups. Uh, and you could also have different player remote controls. Uh, but there's also some additional settings. Let me just see. So as soon as we come here, you could just say, you know, different, you know, playing chords. And there's also where you get to go to, if you click on the settings icon, you could come over here to the pad layout and say, I want it to be a grid. I want it to have four columns of 16 pads. So now you could just come right over here and have, uh, so when you go to the, the chord pads here, you could have, you know, up to 64 different chords that you could have set up. So you could have it look different. All right, thanks for all the great questions. Okay, just going through comments here. All right, so I see Gareth is a, has has activated Lil G as his moniker, his new rap name. That's good. There's his shout out. All right. Um, okay, lots of discussion in Spain. I've been there a few times. Had a great time. Okay, reading through comments. Okay, so I see a question. Is very audio shared in development with Melodyne's company Salomony since they look so familiar? If they are, is there an upgrade path to a higher level of Melodyne produces using polyphonics? No, there's no shared technology between very audio and Melodyne. So, so I think we may use some of the pitch detection algorithms from someone else, but the rest of the programming is done in-house. Okay, so it says, uh, Greg, I'm glad you're teaching. Do you have a total Cubase course where you only teach uh, I can purchase? Um, I've decided not to monetize any of my Cubase stuff, but uh, you know, there's if you go to a lot of the earlier 
you know, I used to do uh, tutorial videos on Club Cubase, youtube.com slash Club Cubase. Uh, and then I just kind of migrated it exclusively to the Steinberg channel um, to kind of optimize it for search engine, SEO stuff, and uh, for effectiveness. So pretty much, you know, but there's a whole series. If you go to the main Steinberg YouTube channel, get earlier stuff is on Club Cubase. There's a lot of tutorials there. You know, the Hangouts are just kind of probably a lot of information you could find there. Um, but I try not to, you know, and even early on, I could have monetized my channel, but I didn't want necessarily the competition buying ads and supporting me to be kind of... I'd be, I'd feel conflicted with that because I'd be targeted. Um, but I just chose to kind of make everything free. So, uh, but you can check out these hangouts. Uh, there's also like eight different playlists of the Greg Undo Q and a series as well, which are just kind of, you know, tying different concepts together. So, Okay, just keep moving on. All right, I just had my timeline jump again. Let me just go back on my chat. Okay. Okay, uh, so it says, hi, Greg, your color uh, fades in the mixer look great. How did you do that? So uh, if you want, I think it's probably just in the mixer color here. So if you want to have the colors, and this is in 10.5, we could go to your preferences and go to uh, under user interface, track and mix console channel setting. So version 10 would just kind of look like this. And now version 10.5 adds this capability and you could have different uh, shading. So if you wanted to have like the selected channel be really bright, you could do that as well. So now if I have a selected channel that becomes like really obviously selected uh, in C of colorized channels. Okay, so uh, we have a question. Uh, what is the advantage and importance of the logical editor? So the logical editor will allow you to do, um, you know, a lot of very, you know, conditional based editing. So if I have, you know, like we showed before, I want to take this note here and let's say I've split it up. I'm just going to hold down the Alt key with my option and I will take, you know, let's say, so let's say I have this one big note here. And let me just adjust this here so we'll zoom in all right so now let's say i just want so the the logical editor is going to be conditional based so if i wanted to let's say i have my controllers here um so i have velocity so if i wanted to you know randomize these notes when i first got into the logical editor um you know it's probably like 1992 ish i was doing an album with a band and the studio wasn't great. So we did uh, electronic drums in MIDI, but real cymbals. Uh, so we had real hi-hat, real crash and ride, and it worked out great. So at that time, the cymbal samples were really awful. But um, ran into a condition where every time the drummer went to the ride cymbal, it sent a false trigger on the tom pad that was triggering a tom-tom very slightly. Uh, and you didn't notice it necessarily during tracking, but during mixing, it was a problem. So we had like, you know, 45 minutes of sequences 
where there was a slight tom tom going on in con- that was slightly behind the ride symbol every time the drummer went to the ride symbol. So instead of looking for that, I set up a condition saying, you know, for every note that, you know, we said every note that is equal to, I think it was like, you know, F1 that has a velocity, which will be on a note message value two, which will be that has a velocity that is, um, so value two, so we could say that is, you know, lower than you know. So let's say I just choose to delete, and we can say value two is less than fifty. You know, then we could choose to delete that particular note. Now, if I have a bunch of notes here, um, like we showed earlier in a Hangout, I could choose to transform the notes, and I could say, let's take value one of a MIDI note messages. And there's a in the manual, there's a whole chart as to what value one, value two is for different MIDI messages. So I say we want to take value one is equal. So we'll say, um, so we'll say type is equal to note. And what I want to do is to transform it. And I want to uh, take the pitch of the note. And you could set up things like, okay, I want it to be random. So value one, the pitch, let's randomize or the value here. And let's say we're at D sharp three. So I want it to be from C two to C four. So now I could say, let's just randomize those notes. Now, if I wanted these notes to fall uh, within a scale, so I could say, let's make it all fall within D major. And then I want to come over here and I want to take value two, which is the velocity and randomize it. Let's say between 40 and 100. So you could also do stuff like I want to take every other velocity or every third velocity and and increase it by 20. So you want to go da 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 You know, you could do stuff like that as well. Um, and let's say if I wanted to create another condition where I had uh, modulation data, um, you could do something else like I just wanted to come here. I wanted to extract... Um, we could say type is equal to controller and value one of our controller is going to be modulation. So, and now at this point, we'll say controller one, then I'll hit apply and that will take that modulation information out and apply it into just a track that's only modulation. So any type of obscure MIDI condition that you want to set up, you can do pretty easily with a logical editor. So that's why it's kind of very powerful. Okay, so a question from Anton. Uh, can Could you discuss buses and how to make the best use of them if you haven't already gone through this? So, you know, one of the great uses of buses is to, like, I have a bunch of tracks and I want to have one fader to control all of my different tracks. So let's say, uh, I'll just revert this quickly. Like, if I wanted to take drums... And instead of moving all of my drums together, and in, instead of, so let's say I'll move all these together here, but let's say if I wanted to take all of my drums and process them through like a compressor, 
I could right click here and just choose to add a group channel to selected channels. So now all my drums are going right here and I could adjust the volume of all of my drums just independently with one fader. And if I wanted to come over here and EQ the drums, and let's say I want to do like an envelope shaper on the drums, and maybe just like a little bit of compression. I wanted the compression after. So now I'm processing kind of all the different. Sources here. So everything's kind of being summed into this one fader that I could adjust to one fader. And I've seen, you know, like my friends Michael Wagner, I've seen projects where he has 12 different kick drum mics and, you know, 15 snare mics. So he has a group for kick, a group for snare, and then he could play and, you know, just simply come right over here and adjust individual volumes. But then he could just have, you know, like all of his groups going, you know, his kick group, a snare group, an overhead group, Tom group, and then that all goes into a drum group. All the guitars could get submixed to a guitar group, all the keys, vocals, background vocals, etc. So it just allows you to kind of simplify, you know, taking a number of sources, processing them together, and being able to control their volumes easily. So that's main uses of buses. Okay, reading through new other comments. All right. Okay, more, just a lot of great comments in here. Okay, just saying a quick comment. Thank you, Steinberg and dear Greg. Yeah, hope it's been helpful and you learned a couple of tricks. I just see Gregorio es la leche. Does that mean I'm milk? Sorry, my, my Spanish is probably rough. Uh, okay. Now Gareth is just showing off with his Spanish. He's probably just using a translate. It's like me in Japan. Okay, so it says I updated from Cubase to Nuendo 10. My preferences did not transfer audio connections control room. Also, no more access to Cubase after installing Nuendo. How can I transfer my settings now? Um, depending on... I'm not sure if you're on Mac or PC, but you'll have a, if you go into the preferences, um, you, you, on a Mac, you'll go into your preferences. Uh, so you may have to just go into finder. And then if you hold down command, you'll go to library or, or I'm sorry, alt or option, you'll go to library, and then in there you'll see a preferences folder. Um, and you could copy that preferences folder, which would include all of your key commands, you know, all those different settings. On the Windows platform, um, you would basically come over here and go to your start menu, and you would go to all programs. And then you'd see, you know, Steinberg, Cubase, you know, 10.5, 9.5, whatever. And then instead of clicking to start the program from the start menu, kind of open the program group, and then you'll see a track settings or like application data folder. Copy that folder into the same location for Nuendo, and all those settings will transfer over. Um, and if, if you need, like, you know, you could look for the user location ref, uh, preferences locations. 
uh, on the Cubase. You know, if you just search for that, you could find it. But you could also email me, and I could send you kind of exact links, and you'd have to substitute your, um, you know, your admin name probably. But you could email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de. But they are transferable. Okay, so I see, how can I create a pattern in Groove Agent, then drag the pattern into Cubase and separate the drum pattern into uh, separate tracks, but use the one same instance of Groove Agent as an instrument? Okay, so I'm going to start off with uh, an instrument track for this. So I'll just go to my instrument rack. All right, well, I'll actually use uh, not Groove Agent SE because it's actually asked for Groove Agent. Okay, so, but I'll show with the full Groove Agent, but let's say basically the same thing so I'll just come over here okay so I'll just program world's worst drum beat so I'll come over here um, so with the full groove agent, you could come over here, go to the pattern, and we just click on. Okay, so I'll just make sure. All right, so when I kind of come here, you just set this sailing the pattern, and let's me get to the. All right, so let's say I have my pattern here and I now drag this over and let's just, just drag my pattern here. So I'll just say, and then we'll activate the Omni mode. Okay, so I have my pattern So what I want to do now is to just grab my MIDI and choose to dissolve part and we'll say separate pitches. And now uh, what I want to do is just to assign these to the same groove agent. So So if I just, there's just a kick. So now as I just kind of come right over here, I could now see my hi-hat. So now each of these are broken down into different patterns and but if you do it as a VST instrument, like an instrument track, then it will create new instances of Groove Agent when you do the dissolve part. Uh, but if you start with just a instrument track uh, or, or an instrument rack, a MIDI 
track that's routed to a VST instrument, then do it, then they'll all be kind of carried over directly there. So try starting with the uh, instrument rack for a MIDI track instead. All right. All right, so um, so I see a question. How can we isolate the voice part of an old recording? For example, from an old tango, how can we isolate the voice of Carlos Gardel? Um, there are a couple tools which can which are getting better at kind of unmixing stuff. There isn't anything in Cubase, um, you know, but there are some tools. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, my friend Scott Esters and his company has a tool to do it. It's not perfect. It's not perfect to do it. You know, it's very hard to just extract a voice uh, when there's, you know, pianos and guitars are very similar frequencies, but you know, some of the unmixing stuff is getting, it's getting better and better all the time. So kind of really, uh, you know, but it's not natively done in Cubase. Okay, so just see. Okay, just reading through comments. So lots of great discussion going on. Okay, just reading through comments. So that's a great discussion again. And you see some other people uh, recommending for separating the isotope RX7 rebalance. So. Uh, so I see a question. Hi, Greg. What film is Ryan watching? I think he watched some Disney movie about soccer, and now he's on some Disney kid show. He likes uh, movies and films with TV shows, and they have to have kids in them. Animation for his for him being seven is too, you know too young, so it has to have kids. It's important. Okay. And I'm just seeing a comment upgraded to 10.5 Pro with a recent discount. Yeah, if you're you know looking at getting onto into Cubase or upgrading, there's the current I think it's 40% off promotion, and you could basically if you're buying Cubase for the first time, you could actually get it for 40% off. So I think basically you can buy Cubase Artists and get Cubase Pro free this month. Okay, um, so just see, do you have a complete series of beginners tutorials that are up to date with the latest version? I don't, but you know, pretty much most of the stuff is going to be applicable. But you know, we keep adding new stuff all the time, so it's hard to, to uh, you know, do my job and come up with that much content for new stuff. But you know, I kind of again learned kind of one thing new and you know take it slow and you know but really check out like what is available on the youtube channel all right uh hi greg what level should i record vocals at i've seen levels as low as minus 17 db um so it, a lot of times i try to aim for like minus 12 or minus 6 db it could really depend upon the project and how dynamic the range would be if it's going to be very soft or very loud 
Um, you know, I've seen some people like working in broadcast. I remember I was doing some work over at NPR, uh, you know, and when they would have for their radio, it's it's kind of like the BBC in America, similar concept. But, you know, when you looked at their amplitude for just to give you an idea, their amplitude was always like really small, kind of like this for their peaks. And they're very, very conservative with their levels. So it could, you know, I try to leave, you know, additional headroom and I try to be a bit conservative, just kind of old school analog and digital mentality. Um, I may not have to be that. I know a lot of people aim for minus six as a good point and you could bring up the level if needed or kind of ret, you know, compress it a bit if needed, but, you know, try to have something consistent to work with. So, um, it, it could, you know, really depend upon the project, uh, what you're doing as well, but, you know, between minus 12 and minus six is a good ballpark area to be at. Okay. Uh, question, Greg, how do you make third party VST instrument icons show up? So I think I installed a VST, a third party VST instrument here for demonstration purposes. So let's say I go to my media bay, I go to my VST instruments. So let's say I have, uh, so I got the a towel plug in here. So right now I don't have any picture here and once you have the plug-in all you have to do is you see this little camera icon click there and that will automatically add the snapshot of the plug-in so even if you don't like the current plug-in snapshots that Steinberg give you you can modify it just open the plug-in and click on the little camera and then that image will automatically show up right there and within your media bay Okay, so feature request, can we get the option to create a project mixer view from selected tracks and save them as a configuration within the project? Um, so, might be able to fake this, let's see. Right, so let's say I have these channels selected. All right, so let's say I have these channels selected and I think we could set up a project logical editor. So let's see if we could do this. So let's say it's in a uh, container. Let's say property is set to event is selected and, or let's say event is not selected. Okay, let's see if I may have. Okay, so let me just see if I could get this, but I think.
Okay, so let's say if I do this. Okay, let me undo. Okay, so let's say I will, so let's say property, so let me say container type is equal to track property event is set to not selected. Okay, so I think that this may do what you want, Terry. So I'm gonna hide my input channels. Um, let's say if I come here, I have all these tracks. So I have these three tracks selected. So I set up a project logical editor um, and I'll save this as a preset. And we'll say, I tracks not selected. And I have this set up in the visibility to sync project and mix console. So I have these three tracks selected. I hit apply and then that's all I see in the mix console. And then, you know, we could just kind of come right over here. So see if that I'm just going to So, and so I think, you know, give that a shot. So if I have these tracks selected, let's just say that, that, and this, and with this logical editor preset, just boom. And then that will show you only the selected tracks. So, so let me know if that works for you, Terry. Okay, we had our one new thing for Gareth to learn with Cloner, so that's good. I, I've accomplished my mission on Hangout of teaching Gareth one thing that was enlightening and new to him. Okay, let's just... Okay, so just saying nice comment from uh, Terry that he's using the uh, control room uh, because of seeing it on a Hangout, so that's good. Okay, so I see a question, just installed 10.5 and lost the ability to record. 9.5 worked fine. I've tried everything I could think of. Any advice? You know, make sure that A, you know, when you're coming to a new project, you know, try to, you know, check your where the files are going to. And you want to, like, I usually have it set for a prompt for a project location. Uh, so I'll just say create empty. Then I choose the folder where I want it to be the project. I think of every project as a new folder. When I do this, um, I can do that. And I also see a lot of times when people, you know, go to add an audio track and let's say um, we have this and maybe they don't have uh, an input defined. So make sure that you have your inputs here. So let's say if I just jump back to, um, let's say one stereo, but if I don't have 
Um, and I go to my inspector here and it's set to no bus. Then, you know, like this one has uh, a bus defined, but this one doesn't. So it's set to no bus and then I'm unable to record. So make sure that you have, you know, your input bus enabled and that it's actually routed somewhere. So I've seen some people have their inputs, you know, but these will be set to not connected. So they'll have their inputs and they just kind of come right over here and, you know, they can say, oh, okay, I just want to go to my stereo input and then nothing comes across, but make sure that you actually in the audio connections under inputs have those inputs defined. So give that a shot and you can let us know if it works out. Uh, so it says, hi, Greg, uh, will you be doing the Hangouts regularly on Mondays and Thursdays from now on? If so, it works really nicely with my week schedule. Thank you once again for these educational live casts. I'm gonna, I think most people that I'd asked uh, on the Thursday Hangout, if Thursday or Friday worked better for them, and a lot of people said Friday worked really nicely. Um you know, if, if people want it on Mondays, I'm amenable to doing that. I'm fine with doing it. I just kind of had done it on Tuesdays and Fridays. It's also a little easier for people to, like our social uh, media team, to send out invitations on Mondays for Tuesdays as opposed to having to worry about getting stuff lined up on a Sunday when most people aren't working. So we may try to stick to Tuesdays and Fridays unless people really hate it, but maybe we could alternate a little bit, but I'm trying to keep the, try to keep it consistent. Um, yeah. And as Gareth mentioned, people were trying to go over there. Okay. And, you know, the hangouts are always going to be, um, you know, available to see offline. Okay, so a uh, high grade question. What are the possible ways to do ripple deletes in timeline or insert space in either one track or multiple tracks? So let's take a look. And we could do this with the range tool. Okay, so let's say if I wanted to do one track, I could just grab my range tool, uh, then you get to edit to range and you could just say delete time. So just, and that will knock it over. And if we wanted to do that across multiple tracks, I could select all of the tracks here and let me just hide this. And again, just shift, X and that will, or I'm sorry, command shift X and that will delete. Uh, if I undo that, so if I wanted to add space, so again, just using the range selection tool and you can find these functions for, you know, under the edit to range and here you could just come over here and insert silence, so command or control shift E. So if I wanted to get rid of that control, Command or Control Shift X. So at this point, just take that. And if you wanted to just hold down, um, you know, do this globally, you could just hold down, you know, and just, you could just hold down Control or Command plus Shift and that will do globally. So Control, Command, Shift X to get rid of. I'll undo that and to insert space, Command, Control, or shift plus E and that will add the space. And again, these functions edit to range. Okay. So we had some questions that were sent in. I know we're running a little late. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. Okay, so it says, uh, I want to play the violin along with accompaniment uh, and route two signals, violin and pre-recorded accompaniment to the Zoom conference application. I'd like to use the MR816 input reverb 
and morphing channel strip on my violin signal uh, and kind of um, so and went through kind of a very detailed uh, synopsis of how it's set up. Um, so it says now when I play the Cubase project and play the violin in the microphone, I hear only hear the violin uh other zoom but no effect if i change the zoom's input to sound flower channel two i only hear the accompaniment so i cannot hear both it seems zoom will only consider the first channel that goes into the signal from to ignore the other one i assume that this is the same in skype facetime etc i've tried several other settings such as using the only uh using only the mr interface but when i'm uh, but when I am the monitor, I get feedback loop and violin repeats a phrase six times each time with lower volume. Uh, bottom line, is there a way to hear a recorded signal on track one and new input signal on track two at the same time without a arming the monitor with the MR effects in another application? I'd like to route the monitor outputs for MR, I find it's passed through the RevX channel strip to sound. Um, so what I would try to do, uh, and with Soundflower, I'm assuming that you're on a Mac. I would, you know, I wasn't able to test this with my Mac and MR816 because I don't have a USB-C to Thunderbolt 2 to Firewire uh, adapter anymore. Um but if the one thing I would suggest is maybe if you have an audio input on your Mac is to maybe take the headphone out of, you know, so I know a lot of the Macs, depending on your Mac, if you still have an audio input or another USB audio interface, I would consider taking like the headphone out of the MR816 and sending it into a different device and then sending that device and using the secondary device as a way to get the audio into Zoom. You know, just the audio capabilities on programs like Zoom and sharing the audio, they tend not to be ideally suited for people who are doing professional audio with um, DAWs like Cubase, and especially if you're doing real-time effects such as what you're doing on your uh, with the MR816. So I would really, if you have the option of, if you have an audio input or getting an inexpensive USB audio interface, that, that that's how I kind of do my hangouts is I take um, my audio interface that's connected to my Mac and that goes into a little Yamaha mixer. My microphone goes into the same Yamaha mixer. And then I use my interface for the Mac and I use the mixer for broadcasting through OBS and the Hangouts and for Zoom meetings I do. So if you have a way of, you know, going into the audio in of your Mac or something like that, that would that may provide a, a very reliable solution for you. Okay. Okay, so we had a question. I have a project here that I had developed for this. So let me just jump to this. Okay, so it says, uh, um, so may I ask if you had to use parts from three or more different songs in order to make a new song from the samples you combine, uh, what would be the perfect way for you to do it? Um, so, and, so, and I think this was like when different songs are coming in at different tempos. How do you make them all kind of fit together? So let's say we have uh, something where we have like a drum loop and maybe a bass. And these came from different. And these are all set to different tempos and they don't fit together. So what we want to do is to make sure that they have a correct origin tempo. So when you go into your pool window, you want to make sure, and as audio is recorded into Cubase and most loops will have an origin time here for tempo. So once it has that, then you could place these all into musical mode and you can hold down the shift key and just select musical mode for all of the events. Um, and another thing you could do is come right over here and just select the events on our timeline. So right now we see 
these are all really out of time and all three of these are different tempos from different projects. So I could select it and then on the info line here, I could just put it into musical mode. And once I do that, now they will all follow kind of like a tempo parasite where we could just come right over here and just So now these will all follow the tempo. So before we had the bass, but if I wanna take all these and put them into musical mode, they will all kind of just fit into the same timing. So select the files and put them into musical mode, either from the pool or directly from uh, the info line, and then you should be all set. Um, okay, so, uh, and then, which is the best way you suggest for a contemporary composer to work in Cubase? The MIDI notes uh, make a lot of confusion in my mind. You know, if you're doing a lot of stuff, you know, I would, you know, get to be very familiar with the key editor, so... You know, let's say if I wanted to, let's take a Schubert piece here. Um, you know, and you see like tons of composers that just play their Cubase projects and they select all the parts in the key editor so that you could see it. So this is really, you know, and I think Rick Ballantyne mentioned it on one of his Facebook posts recently. And he's like, this is the new master score for composers, you know, and I thought it was very apt so he just selected all the parts and just would go in uh, and we could colorize. Let's say each part will be like perhaps a different color. And this is really, you know, understand that a score that's really well done and a really well composed piece that you'll see all the different elements visually that will line up. So get familiar with, you'll see that, you know, the great composers, they'll have really compelling patterns and these patterns that fit musically will work. So take a piece of music that you're familiar with and, you know, come to grips with what you're seeing visually and it will make a lot of sense. And you'll notice that, you know, great compositions will have, you know, very interesting visual patterns as well. So that's what I would recommend. Um... All right, so we also had a question. Um, so let's move on. I've been watching some of your Club Cubase videos and thanks for all the tips and advice. I've been a casual Cubase user since the, the basic version given away with Sound Blaster 64 audio cards and then upgraded to VST, SX, and so on. Even though I'm just a hobbyist, I've invested in, in uh, Cubase Pro 10.5s. I want things as streamed aligned as I can, which brings me to my question. My Cubase is, my setup is fairly old, a Moto 828 Mark II interface with a Behringer ADAD ADA 8000 for extra I.O. I'm using direct monitoring, so I set the onboard mixer of the Moto to mute. Uh, I have two outputs configured in Cubase, a main mix, which is routed to uh, an AVR in my home theater, set to main mix, a virtual output for recording external instruments. Uh, I have control room enabled and have the following outputs. Monitor one, my desk monitors. Monitor two, my headphones. I did this rather than use headphones outputs so I can much easily, so I could switch easily rather, uh, between monitors and headphones and retain the preview features uh, in either selection. Uh, QMix 1 set to my headphone amp for recording. QMix 2 sent to the mix input some electronic drums so I can have a click recording mix. 
uh, note, if I set up an audio track to record an instrument or vocal and enable monitor on that track, I can hear the input via direct monitoring on the Q mix, but not on the monitor mix. So I tried to find out where the direct monitoring routing is defined, but I'm lost. I'm sure I'm missing something incredibly obvious, but I haven't been able to find the power, the answer online or in the manual either. So if you wanted to use the headphones as the preview channel, and this might simplify things, there's a preference. So if you come over here to VST to control room, you could use the phones channel as the preview channel. So if you click right there, you could see that. Um, as you, the one thing that I would check, so if, depending on if you're on Mac or PC, if you're on Windows, you go to your studio setup, select your audio interface here, and then you could turn on direct monitoring. You probably want direct monitoring disabled. Um, so make sure that you can do that. Now, if it's on Mac, most audio interfaces, uh, because core audio doesn't have direct monitoring as a part of its, uh, protocol, you may have to do it within like the Motu QMix software. Now, one thing that I would try just out of curiosity is when you said, um, you mute the direct monitoring in the mix in the Motu, I would try to maybe not do that and see what you get. I think that may be the problem. I think it's going to be just a routing issue within your Motu. So I would try those things. Okay. Um, okay, let's go on to the next question. Okay. Um, so do you have a question? Um, is there, okay. So we had also a question from the last hangout where people noticed that, uh, when they went into, and they colorized via chord pad in the editor. So let's say we have our chord track here. So let me just sneak back to this. They had dark blue notes. And I hadn't really come across this before um, in my demonstrations of chord track over the years. So I always saw kind of a light blue. And the question was, why are these notes showing up as dark blue, uh, like a bright blue as a, you know, so I always thought that there was three colors before this, that there was green that indicated that the notes were within the chord, blue, like kind of a light blue indicating that they're within the scale, uh, and red indicating that they were out of key. So, you know, we could see, like the chords like this, but then someone sent me a screenshot uh, that they had these bright, bright, brighter blue notes here and asked what those were. So I did some research on this and I found out that when you have a note that fits the chord, but is not within the defined scale. So if this chord is not within the scale, um, but the notes fit the chord, that's when you get these bright blue notes. So that's why you have those differences in colors. Um, so we see, um, okay, so I have a question that you may have covered already. Is there a way to record playback at half double speed looking um, to record something slower and then playing it back at twice the speed, one octave higher and vice versa. So we kind of do this, um, a couple ways. So one way that I've seen people do is just for a particular part is to, you know, do a very speed playback. This isn't automated, but I've seen people just record the output of this. So if you go to, uh, your key commands, and under transport, we can see, um, shuttle play. So if we wanted to do this, um, so I've seen people that would just take the output of this and record it as audio. So say you're doing this and I think I have it set for it. Let me see what my key command is for that. 
Um, It's a command control option number two. So let's see. Let me just revert this quickly. So if I just hit that, I could play back. As soon as I hit that key command, it's not actually kind of part of the program. Like you can't automate it, but it's like a shuttle. And if I wanted to do it like twice as fast, I could just kind of come over here, uh, go to my key commands. And let's say I wanted to be shuttle play two times. So I'll just set a key command combination here. So I could play, it says half speed and half the pitch. Playback normal. Now you could, and it's obviously you're gonna get some artifacts as you do that because it's a pretty extreme amount. But I could also take all these files and put it into musical mode. and I'll put these into elastic tape. So if I wanted this, I could just say, and this would be like an analog tape. So if I wanted it to be 200 beats a minute, or 80 beats a minute, this would change the pitch along with it. So you could automate this through different tempo changes. We want to go back to original tempo. So you could have a tempo map that goes from 50 to 100 to 200, and you could have all sorts of different uh, playback speeds and variations. Okay, so um, we see that a question came in over Facebook. Uh, maybe you can cover this question in the next Hangout. I was wondering if there is a way to export a custom kit with all the samples. I mean. I have to move my own kits from one computer to another. Is there a way to export the whole kit with the samples? And I assume this is in Groove Agent. So let's say uh, I will have a Groove Agent instance here. And I'll go ahead and just cut the kit. And let's say if I wanted to drag samples, like let's say a kick drum. Let's say I want a hi-hat. And let's say a snare. So now I have, so I have different samples here uh, and I wanted to export this. I would just come right over here right click on the agent and export kit with samples and you could save it to your desktop to anywhere you want and then you could use it kind of uh where, however you wanted to just do that so again once you have your samples in just right click and uh export kit with samples we also had someone that wanted to take a like a base like a sample and have it play back in the sample track and and uh, make that um, not change the length of the sample. So let's say I want to take this bass part and I'm going to right click and just add it to the sampler track. So I'm going to create a sampler track from it. Now as I play faster, <clears throat> if I play a higher pitch or lower pitch, 
you can see that the sample playback is going to be different speeds. But if I want it to be the same speed regardless of pitch, just go to the left here and you could activate the audio warp. And we could just say, okay, I want it to, you know, just be in solo mode. And now as I play, that's how you can make your samples all the same. All right, so um, we're just about out of time. We've gone about three hours and 57 minutes. So uh, I want to thank everyone for, if I go a little bit longer, we'll lose all the closed captioning, which uh, helps a lot of people who uh, English isn't their primary language, and I'm, not, I'm just uh, not smart enough to do it in multiple languages. So uh, this way we'll get the live captioning. Uh, we'll try to have the index done later this evening. Uh, I'm going to take my son to the pool, uh, do a little socially distant swim with him, then come back and do the index later tonight. We'll look for the next Hangout to be on Friday at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern, so the same time, and then we'll probably get back on our Tuesday and Friday schedule unless people totally hate that. I want to thank everyone for the wonderful questions that you've had. Um, it's been a thrill being able to help people throughout the whole world. Um, and I really want everyone to stay safe and healthy, uh, make some great music and we will see, to, we'll see you on next Friday's hangout. If you want to send questions in advance, please send it to club Cubase at Steinberg.de and check out the great Cubase promotion that's currently going on. And we'll see you on Friday. Take care. <laughs>